bespoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Yeah, man. Welcome. Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the masses. <laughs> yeah, man. Today's Tuesday, August 15th, 226 days into the new year. Just 139 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and tither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? All right. Yeah, man. All right. You know, right before the show every night, I get to go and hang out on the bunker cam with everybody for about five minutes right before the show. And uh, if you ever want to go and check that out, just, uh, you know, get yourself a little uh, membership package. That's all you got to do. Get the membership package or one of them and get the bunker camp. I was saying to everybody right before the show, the world is crazy right now. It's, It's nuts out there. And we have fade to black to ground us. And I need it. And if I need it, if I need it, I need it to escape. Right? And tonight we have Laird Scranton here. We get to go and and study a little history and get our learn on, which is what this show is always about, right? Just just get our learn on. Tonight we're going to do that with Laird. And and I need that. I do. I do. Think just think about what I'm saying here. We need to just get centered. Just get centered. Ah, just get centered. (laughs) Om. As I rub my crystals right here in the studio. I'm doing it right now. You can see it on the bunker cam. Tonight, Laird Scranton is here. We're going to talk Dogen. We're going to talk ancient Egypt. I want to talk about the gods of Egypt. Lost history. The Maori of New Zealand. His new book that is uh, due out shortly. You know, so let's get our learn on tonight. Tomorrow night, David Wilcock. He is back. David took a few months off. He needed to take a life break. Well, he did that. And he is back. Only on Fade to Black, by the way. I want you to understand. He posted over in Divine Cosmos. I don't know if you have read uh, his latest posting. Very interesting read. Um, and it's always great when David is on the show. So tomorrow night, it's uh, it's going to be a barn burner. Okay, we're going to burn this sucker down tomorrow night with David Wilcox. So get ready. And uh, and then Thursday, I do need to remind everybody. Thursday, we're taking uh, the day off. We will be departing for Mount Shasta for the Eclipse of Disclosure Conference up in Mount Shasta. I, we've got a lot of fader knots going. I cannot wait to see all of you up there uh, getting getting those emails and the texts and the posts from, from people that are going. And 
Uh, I just, it's one of the best parts of going uh, to conferences is to get to go see the Fader Knots and hang out because it is a big family. And we're going to be up there uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday is the eclipse. And then we head back sometime that afternoon and uh, come back to Los Angeles, okay, for the show on Tuesday. And uh, so there you go. All right. Um, what what was I going to say? Oh, um, we're going to be doing, uh, amongst other things, uh, Bearing Optics is going to be up there. We have been waiting uh, to announce our relationship with Bearing Optics. Uh, we were looking for the best uh, uh, night vision company out there, and Bearing Optics is it. They are the best. So those announcements are going to come uh, next week um, as uh, we we were running in the background here. What I wanted, what I want to say, and what I can say are two different things. But we, over the last couple of months, have been working with Bearing Optics to uh, get all of the logistics in order here. Okay, because when we go <clears throat> and put our name fade to black, my name uh, on on a product. Uh, it has to be the absolute best. Everybody's asking me which, 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 you know, which, well, okay. There's some really cool things coming right around the corner. And there is going to be, uh, I'm going to say it now, and I think it might be up at Mount Shasta, the, uh, the Jimmy Church model, right? And I asked for very specific things to be done uh, to these night vision goggles. It has to be, you know, there, and, and, and if it's all done and pulled off, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, you guys are going to be blown away. Okay. All right. There you go. Okay. All right. So that's, uh, that's going on this weekend. Night vision for four nights. Oh man, we're going to lose our minds. Mount Shasta. So that's the week. Follow us on Twitter at J church radio, Facebook, YouTube, everything is fade to black J church radio. You can go right now, follow, like, and subscribe over on the website. The sandbox is hashtag F2B on Twitter. Very simple. We don't bite. Come over and hang out with us. All right. Hashtag F2B. Is it beer? No, I don't think if I'm reading that correctly. Uh, no, beer would not be added to night vision goggles. I gotta think about that for a second. Uh, a chilled vodka dispenser. Now that that would work. Oh, okay. Fade to black beer. Fade to black vodka is right around the corner. That I can promise all of you. Okay. Last night during the show, um, there was, uh, and thank you, Fader Knots, for just staying on the case and and being there. Last night during the show. It was announced that uh, the breaking news was that uh, North Korea uh, blinked, right? North Korea blinked, and we've never seen North Korea blink before, but they blinked. They blinked. What was the reason for it? I don't know, but they blinked, and that relieved a lot of tension. It's just, it's just funny, though. Why would they blink? Did they get the phone call, <laughs> right? Did Kim Fatty Fat get the phone call? I think that he did. Okay. All right. Mike. Well, you know, if uh uh the don't forget, don't forget the guy bringing 50 strains of ganja. Okay. All right. Yes, um I'm getting uh text coming in. The answer Rita is yes, but we'll do that during the break, okay? Can't do it right now. Unless you want me to do it right now. Do I need to do it right now? Can't wait to, for the break. Okay, I'll do it right now, Re. There you go. Boom. Done. See, this is why I don't, that's why it should wait because everybody has to listen to me talk and click and do things at the same time. Okay, um, <clears throat> that's the weekend. Night vision goggles. Mike, if we were going to add certain things to the night vision goggles and it's me... Don't you think that that would be one of the things? But it that's difficult, right? Because that's why nobody else does it, right? Right? Think about that. 
Yeah. All right. But my, Mike, you're a pretty smart dude. And we'll make those announcements uh, very soon. Okay, Re, I'm up and flying on that end, just so you know. Let's get the show cracking right now. Happy birthday to Ben Affleck. He is 45 years old. Ben Affleck. Kevin Smith. Maybe you like him. Don't even lie. Because you know it's the truth. Anthony Anderson today is 47. One of the funniest guys in the business. And I say this every time. I'm going to do it now. Anybody in barbershop will always make the birthday list. He was JD in barbershop. On this day in history, OTD 1969, the Woodstock Festival opens in Bethel, New York. Still the gold standard, right? The gold standard of music festival. Everybody wants to be Woodstock. Covered in mud, rain, happiness. No, uh, <laughs> no it was weird. There was no incidents. They were expecting 50,000, then they raised it, and they were saying, oh, maybe 100,000, maybe, you know. And the estimates were 400,000 to 500,000 people showed up. No facilities, nowhere to go to the bathroom, nowhere to sleep, eat, do anything. But it just didn't matter. 1969, right? And it is still the gold standard of music festivals. There is no doubt about it. Fader fact. Now, this is a fader fact. So everybody over in England, in Great Britain, right now, the U.K., the United Kingdom, I want to see your responses to this fader fact because I have vetted it. Okay? All right. 90%, 90% of Britons eat pizza at least once a week. There you go. And, and I did the ultimate sin right there. My phone is on. <laughs> I didn't mute my phone. 90% of Britons, how is that possible? You have to ask yourself. I didn't, I don't think, I don't think anybody in the United, really pizza once a week. I would do it, I guess, if I could. But 90% of Britons, that doesn't even make any sense. So I do want I, I I want to see light it up in Twitter right now. Let me know. All right, tonight Laird Scranton is here. Dogen, Egypt, lost history. We're going to do it all. I want to talk the gods of Egypt. Something that we don't do much here on Fade to Black. Right? We talk about Egypt all the time. The gods of Egypt. What was going on? We're talking about prehistory here. We're going to go back, and that's what we're going to do tonight. Jordan just said he ate pizza for breakfast. Yeah, but you live in Boulder. You live in Colorado, <clears throat> where now with all the weed that is smoked in that state, I would think if I was going to open up a pizza joint right now, I would open it up in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> but I'm bumped. I would. I would. Seriously. Who who was it that just opened the pizza joint there and said it was? Wasn't that like um. Wasn't that Peyton Manning? Wasn't it somebody like that just opened up a string of pizza joints and they said they did it because weed was going to be legalized? Yeah. <laughs> All right. You guys, what what is it with weed and this show? Because it's legalized now across the country, it's just like the uh, the subject. <laughs> Look at these tweets. Oh, man, don't surprise me as I am a Brit, but we prefer our curries. Yeah, now see, if somebody said 90% of Britons um, eat Indian food at least once a week, I'm down with that, right? I, you know, I would be down with but pizza, really? Man, they probably don't even do that in Italy. Pizza is American, right? That uh, That's always, that's a good, right there, that's a good urban legend. Right, that uh, pizza and spaghetti are, are American invents. All right, tonight, Laird Scranton. Tomorrow night, David Wilcock is here. Thursday night, we're taking off. I want to remind everybody, tickets and information are still available. If you have not made plans for the eclipse, come and hang out with us up at Mount Shasta. All right, the banners are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Tickets and info are right there. I know, 
I know this because we just went through this with some friends. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be packed. Let's just say that. All right. Guinness Pizza. <laughs> Papa John's in De- Peyton owns several Papa John's in Denver. Is that true? Is that what, <laughs> is that what he did? I, I had read he did the investment because weed was going to be legalized. And I'm telling you, if you... If you're going to go and research, you're going to invest. I, I'm glad that somebody like Peyton actually went and did the research. Why would I want to open up, invest in pizza joints in Denver? Oh, wait a minute. Pot's going to be legalized there. Let's <laughs> let's open up as many as we can. Think about that. Pizza and weed go together, Jimmy, and fade to black. Weed and fade to black go together. No getting around it. Really? I thought everybody drank during this show, right? Now, are you telling me that you guys are smoking weed when you listen to Fade to Black? (laughs) Is that right? Oh, man, that is funny. You guys are too much. The the United States Department of Justice has uh, demanded uh, that a website host hand over 1.3 million IP addresses of people who visited a page that organized Inauguration Day protest against President Donald Trump. And this is coming from the hosting company, DreamHost. After everything that we just went through in Charlottesville, and, and protest and racism and bigotry and, and, and so forth. Going down this road <clears throat> is a dangerous one. We, we really need to stop and think about this. A search warrant was issued by the Superior Court of the District of Columbia, uh, and it requests that DreamHost provide all information available to them about their, this website, which is disruptj20.org. The page for the organized process against Trump's inauguration back on January 20th. The warrant, dated July 12th, was made public yesterday. It would involve the host handing over 1.3 million IP addresses. 1.3 million. In addition to contact information, email content, and photos of thousands of people. Now, we are getting into a zone here. There's a zone. There's a line in the sand. There's a place where we just don't want to go. This is one of them. The hosting company is attempting to fight the Department of Justice's highly untargeted demand, saying that it views the warrant as a, a strong example of investigatory overreach and a clear abuse of government authority, and it is just that 100%. You can't get it's the shotgun principle, right? Go in, let's collect all of the data on everybody on this website and let's see what we can make stick. Let's see what's going on here. You want to target one individual? You want to figure out so if you have information on one individual and whatever. You you've you've got evidence of something? What protest in Washington, DC? Okay, yeah, maybe something went violent somewhere. You got something on somebody? Go. Go to their house, get their computer. Why would you need an IP address? You want to see where he was? Okay, fine. You want to see if he is on some ISIS website? Fine. You want to see if he's checking out child pornography? Fine. But don't do not go backwards on this and go, hey, let's go to this website. Let's collect data on everybody. All right? No. And and I'll give you... An example, this this website for the, the white neo-Nazi, you know, retards, those guys, whatever it is, I'm not going to give them publicity by saying the name of the website here. But what if what just went down in Charlottesville? Oh, so let's go to blah, 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 dot com and let's go and get. I'll collect all of the data, all of the information. Let's just round everybody up. Let's see what we can make stick on everybody that that visit. You know what? No. No. It's not the way the world works. We start going down this road in this country, and now we are at Big Brother. We are at the Ministry of Truth. We are at the, 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 the corruption of power taking over. I don't want to be... Uh, some of those other shock jock radio hosts out there. 
I don't want to be that guy. And I don't want to be that guy right here and right now. I, I don't. But when it comes to this, and the infringement of rights, because of what I do and how I do it and the methodology of that and those out there right now that are listening to me, via whatever avenue that you're listening to me on, a large majority of you are listening to me on the Internet. And I, just like every country in the United States and around the world, I have a website and I have uh, social media and and I have all of the things that come into play with that. Every company in the world now uses YouTube. Everybody uses social media. Everybody's got a Twitter account, right? So I understand the importance of the Internet. And if you turn around now and start to use the Internet like this, in a shotgun principle style of things where uh, you shoot into the dark in a shot with a shotgun and hopefully you're going to hit something somewhere, right? That's exactly it. Think about that for a second. It's very, 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 very important. If you think about it, the, the, the search warrant not only claims to identify the political descendants of this current administration, but it attempts to identify and understand what content of each of these dissidents viewed on the website. And, and then once you go and you get those IP addresses, it's going to reach out beyond that. And, uh, and, and probably most important here with this. When we look at what just went down in Charlottesville and we think about everything that is going on all at the same time, every time Trump, I don't, I'm not a Trump supporter. I'm not against, he's the president of the United States and we need to find a way to support this guy so we can get some work done, but we're not getting anything done. Nothing is getting done here. And if you think about the way the the deep state or the Illuminati or anything else, you know, the powers, the corruption, the things that are running in the background right now, it appears like numerous, infinite amounts of groups and people just don't like Trump. And they are doing everything every single day to turn around and disrupt uh, the, the House, right? The Senate. You think about this, the Congress, the judicial system, everything, uh, the military industrial compound, the Pentagon, everybody is from every direction constantly just dealing with everything but us. Us. What is getting done in Washington right now? I'm going to, let me answer. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. We have um, uh, we have a president that 100 percent is more concerned with Twitter, who is speaking about him in a positive or negative way, and his responses to that. It seems to me that they have now figured that out, so they are distracting constantly, 100 percent, one of every minute of every day, distracting distracting think about this now let's go back to this program there are disruptions out there that are going on in our community and fade to black there are people out there that are trying to take us me and those in our community off message off message they want us distracted and it's work, you know. It it well, it's not. It's working for. The, it's not working for me, but it's working for others out there. You, the listener, getting distracted, right? You're looking at posts. You're looking at things. You're looking at. Th it's like everything to take you off message. Everything to take you off message. If there is a way, just to get you talking about something else, something else stupid. Let's make something up. Let's do it. Let's. Uh, Fake news. Let's post. Let's do this. Let's accuse this. Let's let's attack this person. Let's attack this. Let's do that. It's like, wait, sh sh shut up. <laughs> it has absolutely nothing to do with anything. Right? And it is now a trend. The trend is everywhere. 
I recognize it. I see exactly what is going on. I I just see it. It's funny. And when, let me tell you, when you go and look at, I wish, I wish anybody here right now could just go and look at my email in just one day and, and look at, uh, I, most of the names I don't know, right? They just come in random, but, and that's part of letting my email address go publicly, right? I just let it go publicly. But the stuff that's coming in, for, it just, man, this guy is saying this. This person saying this. It, man, you need to stop doing this. You need to do that. You need to buy this guy. Stop. I don't care. And it's the exact same thing that is going on. We have the micro and the macro, right? And so it's going on here. It's going on in social media. It's going on in our community. It's flying everywhere. It's all over YouTube. It's all over uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter you know, trolls and just this, this actions. It's, it's hilarious. I don't pay attention to it. I block anybody. I block. If I don't know who you are and you open up your mouth, I block you. And th- there are people that I know that I have blocked. I will block them later, you know, put them in the penalty box, but I block, man. I block, 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 block. It's going on in Washington. It's going on with North Korea. It's going on with Russia. It's going on with China. It's going on. It, it try to take everybody off a message. Let's get a big distraction campaign going on. Who is working for us right now? Right? When Trump took office, I don't know if you know this. When, when Trump took office, the numbers are, and I'm, this is nothing against Trump. This is just a, a fact. Because every president goes through this. You have a bunch of cabinet positions and jobs that you need to fill across the United States and in Washington. Trump took off. I'm going to pull some raw numbers out here. I'm just going to just out of the air. He had to fill 300 positions. 300. Okay. Today, we are seven months in to his his presidency. Okay. He's filled like 50, 60, 70 There are like 250, 220, 250. The numbers are varied. That he's got to fill these positions. He hasn't done it. You know, the Senate needs to do all of these confirmations, and there's nobody there. He hasn't appointed it. They don't even have people to go and interview. He hasn't. Why? He's distracted. (laughs) He's distracted. How can things get done? All of the things when it comes to uh, that we have been supposedly uh, getting taken care of, like taxes, right, or, or or the streets or infrastructure and everything, you know, where where is anything getting done? It's amazing. It's amazing to me. Distraction. And now Charlottesville. So now we're distracted with that. Shouldn't have happened. But now there you go. All the way back to this show. It's all coming. It's all related. It's Fade to Black. Tonight, Laird Scranton. I'll be right back with the mighty Laird. Stay right there. Listening to Jimmy Church fade to black. Fade to black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in, and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black. You create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. 
Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Hi folks, let's wind the clocks back 60 years. Food was different. Food provided health and nutrition, and using supplements was minimal. Unfortunately, now we have chemicals, GMOs, herbicides, and pesticides that can be quite lethal in the name of our food supply and, of course, the ever-loving dollar. Supplementing our diets can be very important to stay healthy. Cleansing from daily intruders to the body might be critical. Live strong and take charge. Log on to GetTheTea.com. Our herbal tea is a great way to cleanse from intruders. Our supplements is a great way to maintain and improve your health. When your health is not up to par, go to GetTheTea.com. No GMOs, no fillers, and organic. And very helpful in keeping you at the top of your game. Life is too short to feel, uh, you know what I mean. Stay in the game, at the top of your game, with GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Again, GetTheTea.com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Win big with KGRA this summer. Tickets and hotel accommodations to the biggest conferences. Autographed books and DVDs. Chances to win all-inclusive conference cruises. And private dinners with your favorite KGRA hosts. Click the contest tab at KGRARadio.com for your chance to win big this summer. Your contact for the best alternative talk radio on the planet. KGRARadio.com. This is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Laird Scranton is here. Tomorrow night, David Wilcock is back with us. It's Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. Laird Scranton, the voice of reason, an independent software designer from Albany, New York, who writes about ancient mysteries, cosmology, and language. His work includes articles published in the University of Chicago's Anthropology News Academic Journal, in Temple University's Encyclopedia of African Religion, and in the Vassar Quarterly Magazine. His book, The Science of the Dogen, was taught at Colgate University under the title Hidden Meanings, a study of the founding symbols of civilization. His books include Sacred Symbols of the Dogen, The Science of the Dogen, The Cosmological Origins of Myth and Symbol, and His latest is, of course, The Mystery of the Scarab Bray, which I have here and we've discussed before on this show. His upcoming book is called Decoding Maori Cosmology. It's due out in May 2018. Tonight, we're going to discuss the Dogen. We're going to discuss ancient Egypt, lost history, their gods, uh, the latest research that he is doing around the world, including the ancient origins of the Maori, uh, New Zealand's indigenous culture. His website is LairdScranton.com. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only Laird Scranton. Laird, good evening. How are you tonight? Hey, Jimmy, I'm good. How are you? Always good to hear your voice, man. The voice of reason, intelligence, all of that. Thank you, Laird. <laughs> Oh, where were you when I was in middle school? Come on. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, I, it, You know, that's funny that you say that because I've heard that a couple of times this week from other people. That actual statement, right, where um, being different, you know, growing up and, and, and going down another path was uh, difficult for us that are in our little circle, you know, of friends. Because we were just a little bit different. I can only imagine for you, you were just a little bit off growing up, weren't you? Oh, 
always just a little bit, but uh, <laughs> uh, the sense of humor, you know, sort of uh, sort of keeps things on a, on a level keel. <laughs> and it has to be. Is that how you got through it? Yeah, pretty much. You know, I really didn't have things bad. I I can't complain. I had one of the more more bland upbringings. Um, in uh, I uh, went to elementary school in Salem, Oregon, which was a pretty white bread place at the time I was there, and then went to high school in Portland, Oregon. Actually, at a really interesting time, which is one of the more interesting uh, places in the country to to go to school. So I really can't complain about how things went for me. And uh, what I was um, uh, ranting about. A little bit here at the beginning of the show is that the distractions that we are having around the world right now, which permeate through um, into our little uh, community of of alternative research and history and, and what we do here and trying to figure out the big conspiracy about what is going on with knowledge Um can you imagine if uh, some of your uh, previous stuff about the Dogen or maybe John Anthony West and uh, what him and Shock did with, uh, the, uh, with the Sphinx so many years ago, if some of this stuff came out today, how you guys, you guys have always been attacked, right? But just imagine today the ability to attack you and other researchers today with uh, with social media and the internet, it would be vicious, wouldn't it? I mean, it, it was always rough, but can you imagine what it would be like today if you guys would uh, uh, break some of this news? Yeah, it could get pretty pretty interesting. I mean, uh, times have changed in terms of uh, civility of discussion and so forth. Um, but I, I feel like uh, John West was one of the groundbreakers. He sort of made things easier for me, a lot easier for me, really, in a lot of ways. Um, speaking of John, uh, he's uh, on the mend in, in Texas. They're talking about at some point trying to bring him home from treatments for cancer. So nobody really thought that he was going to come out of this in the kind of shape that um, that would be allow him to come home again. But it uh, looks like that might happen. Uh, I've, you know, he... Um... Uh, his situation bums me out so much because uh, he did just like you just said. He's done so much for us. You and I did the telethon together, and and everybody knows my 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 take on on John Jaws, you know, and what he means to us. But the uh, we did a conference um, uh, uh, every year together, Contact in the Desert, and this year he wasn't there, you know, and. Um, and it kind of bummed me out. Well, it didn't kind of. It bummed me out. So I brought the empty chair out and I set it down uh, next to the uh, next to the conference table. And you know, we had Graham Hancock and we had Baval there and Robert Shock and and others on the panel. But I said, you know, uh, this this gentleman, John Anthony West, um, because of what we do today. Um, we have the courage to step forward and 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 get business done. He paid the price. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> what him and Shock went through? Um, because if you're going to go and and redate something and try to change history, you can pick something a little easier than the Sphinx, right? <laughs> I mean, yes. Well, yeah. John and and Shock and Robert Boval and Graham Hancock have all had their share of attacks that they've had to deal with, and some of them pretty vicious. Um, I've been fortunate in that I've sort of been under the radar of a lot of that, but um, but I've seen what's what happened for them, and it, it's not pretty a lot of times. No, it is not, no doubt. Now with. Uh, with you, well, like the subjects that you pick, um, and your last book, uh, uh, Scare Bray, which was, as you know, I mean, I've I've read it and it's an amazing book, but uh, the Dogen and the way that, how do you pick your subjects? How, I mean, where do you come? Well, these these subjects tend to pick me, uh, literally. Uh, the Scare Bray book, um, I was asked a question by a distant fan from Australia who I didn't even know. Uh, about Scarab Ray before I had ever studied one word about the place in northern Scotland. And within six weeks, I had the material for a book. Uh, so this is what happens. Uh, the book before that, it was about a three-month process. And again, it came out of sort of a, a very coincidental situation. I had been, been researching uh, 
half a dozen topics for other people about language, and one day they all came together with answers that um, were found on the same in the same column of the same page of the Egyptian Hieroglyphic Dictionary. And the seventh word in that column opened up the material for the book uh, Point of Origin. So the the topics really end up sort of picking me. Uh, it's sort of like wands picking the wizard, I guess. Right, right, right. And uh, the Dogen, which uh, we're going to spend some time there tonight. It's such a fascinating subject. The Dogen, when uh, you started to uh, uncover more and more, there was a lot of blowback on that subject too as well. And a lot of debunking went into, uh, a lot of energies went out there to deflate the story and to uh, to debunk the story, quite frankly. Um, and you had to get through that too as well. Um, and let's talk about that a little bit. How did you deal with that? And were those debunkers just plain wrong? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, the the guest, your upcoming guest you're talking about, David Wilcock, actually interviewed me at one point, and he had done his homework. He went out and he found um, all of those key um, um, debunking um, processes, you know, all the arguments that were made against the work that I had done. He had, had carefully researched what they were and wasn't going to let me shirk um, answering the questions. My... Uh, fortunate position is that the material I'm working with brings the, always brings things down to a why. And so um, in the end, I, I've been able to answer uh, the questions. Um, it also helps that some of the people who are making the accusations or the complaints, the critiques, uh, don't always, haven't always done their homework. They don't always know their subject matter very well. So like Carl Sagan was the person who said that the Dogen knowledge of uh, they have knowledge of stars of Sirius, astronomical knowledge that they shouldn't have. And Carl Sagan said, well, it's clear to him that the Dogen had just um, met up with, you know, come in contact with some modern scientists who gave, gave them the information and they reported it in their myth. But he hadn't gone so far as to research the fact that the Dogen material is given using ancient Egyptian words. And if you go farther back, if you go to the Egyptian myths, you can see the same information reflected in the Egyptian myth. So that kind of thing is pretty easy to knock down. Right, uh, right. Um, your, your, your audio is uh, very, very thin. So, okay. Oh, there you go. That do it better? Oh, Lair. Now I can concentrate. Okay. Sorry about that. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, you know, who, who wants fat audio anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> now I can concentrate. Yeah, it was very, very, very thin. Okay. Uh, let, let's move on. Um, what about uh, when we, uh, the the knowledge of the stars? Let's Let's talk about this for a second. The knowledge of the stars. The the Dogen seem to not only have extreme knowledge, but knowledge that we didn't find out uh, for centuries and centuries later. And even in a modern sense, like in the 1900s, in the 20th century, we didn't find out and confirm a lot of this stuff today. But they had this knowledge, not only them, but other his, historical uh uh, civilizations out there also possess this knowledge before telescopes. How did this happen, and and is it is it actually legit, or are we reading history as wrong? Well, from my point of view, it's it's definitely legit. Um, you can set the Dogen information side by side with science uh, descriptions of matter from wa its wave like form all the way up to the atom. Their descriptions and their drawings side by side with modern descriptions and diagrams, and it's all the right stuff. But beyond that, the Dogen actually talk about things that modern scientists don't talk about. I'll, I'll have an upcoming book that, that deals with those subjects, very primordial discussions of why do we, exp we experience time the way we experience it, and um, uh, what is the real relationship between the non-material things and material things. Uh, all sorts of really interesting questions that Dogen deal with that um, the modern scientists don't try to touch on. Um, you know, the Greek philosophers all thought that there was a, um, a pri primordial ether 
that everything was uh, emerged out of. And, and modern scientists have sort of ignored that. Einstein said, um, felt that that there was a requirement for one in some of his work, but he never really pushed that aspect of it. But the Dogen talk about the concept of an ether and how that works. There are all sorts of really interesting questions. Um, but the, the way the Dogen know it, according to them, is that someone who thoroughly understand the subject matter, understood the subject matter, taught it to them. Right. And the inter interesting part of that is that when they give the knowledge, they don't give it as a theory. You know, when you, th you talk about or you read uh, Stephen Hawking, you know, he's telling you what the latest theory is and what the prevailing uh, point of view is on a subject matter. The Dogen aren't doing that. They're saying, here's how it works. And we know this because someone who understood it told us. You go to Buddhism, and they effectively say the same thing, that someone who understood this stuff, someone in ancient times who had a clear understanding of how it worked, taught them. What and when we look at the <coughs> excuse me, I have something in my throat. That's why I'm going to take a shot of coffee. Mm. Live on the air, very professional. The <laughs> um, the representations that we look at, not only that the Dogen had, but we can go with the Greeks, we can go with uh, the Egyptians, the Mayans, and and different cultures where they're uh, rep uh, talking about the amounts of planets out there. Um, our solar system, the sun, and even even we can look at uh, zodiac representations too as well. Very frightening amount of astronomical, uh, astrological, and astronomical knowledge that couldn't have been uh, achieved without a telescope. So, are we looking at their graphical and symbolism uh, information correctly? Um, yes, and the way that we know that we are. Um one of the requirements in my field of study, my field of study is called comparative cosmology. And the first requirement is that an interpretation has to begin with a flat statement on the part of the culture you're studying. So it doesn't work for me to look at two things and say, gee, that resembles something exotic. And uh, put forward a theory that says that, that this drawing represents this exotic thing because I think it does. The interpretation has got to begin with an authoritative it's an authoritative source within the culture itself, either a, a written text or a living priest or some other authoritative source flatly claiming that the thing is true. And so in the Dogen case, it's their priests who are saying, we're talking about how matter forms. Um, my job as a researcher is just to test the reasonableness of what they're saying. Um, I'm sort of in the role of the the guy on the murder mystery, you know, the TV show that the, the, the murder drama brings the the uh, suspect in and vets him and says, where were you at nine o'clock on Saturday night, the 15th? And if the guy has can present a reasonable explanation of where he was and hear the witnesses who saw me there and so forth, then they know, well, this guy can't be the guy who committed the crime. They let him go. Well, I sort of do that with the facts that Dogen present. Is there any any reason to knock what they're saying out of the water because it, it doesn't hold up factually? Uh, in every case, what the Dogen have said, uh, from my point of view, holds up factually. Um, and it points us to really interesting concepts of how things uh, work. So let's talk about that right now. I was uh, clearing my throat. Okay, now I'm, I'm much better, Laird. I'm much better. Let's talk about some of the evidence that, for you, um, uh, showed you that this is exactly correct, that the Dogen did have this knowledge of, you know, when we are talking about uh, star systems, binary star systems, the possibility, that, I can tell you, Laird, that when I look at the sky and I look at the night sky, I don't know nothing. I don't know what I'm looking at. I see stars and it's beautiful and it's great. Unless I have some kind of crazy star map that has been developed over hundreds of years and, and I can look up or use some software, it'll point me in the right direction. But I can tell you, I don't know the difference between a planet and a star. Uh, I can't see the movements going on in the sky. I, you know, I, I'm not standing there for hours and, and, and days on end, you know, but they did. And other cultures did too as well. So as the evidence started to compile for you, what was your aha moment when you went, okay, you know what? There's something to this. 
Well, one of the key moments, I mean, I started out where you did. I knew about atoms and I knew about protons and electrons and neutrons, but a lot of the rest of it I had to learn about as I went and uh, was doing my comparisons as as people like Brian Greene and Stephen Hawking were trying to explain in layman's terms how th certain things worked. And I could see where the, the connections were. To, my first book is really just a side-by-side -side comparison of what those connections are. But the aha moment came that Dogen des describe a fundamental structure of matter that's basically a spiral. And they give very careful descriptions of how it forms and what its attributes are, how it, how it works. Um, they say that the processes that happen at the level of an atom are parallel to the processes that happen in, in the universe. As above, so below is the, is the hermetic concept. Right. So the aha moment was they took the Dogen talk about a structure they called the chariot of Orion. And they give us information that allows us, if you follow it carefully, what it points you to is a spiraling birthplace of stars that you, we, you and I can't even see. If we try to look at it, it's so faint that you can't see it with the, na the naked eye. You need time-lapse photography to even image it, the small amount of light that it's emitting. But when you do that, when you use time-lapse photography, what you see is the shape of a spiral that centers on the belt stars of Orion, that when you image it looks like the, the wheel of a chariot that Orion the hunter is standing in. That structure is called Barnard's Loop, and from an astronomer's point of view, it's called a stellar, the structure represents a stellar bubble. And when you read the scientific descriptions of how a stellar bubble forms, what stages it goes through to form, what it's eventually going to, is going eventually going to happen to it as it gets older and older and older, it's a direct match for how the Dogen described this little, this spiral of matter. How is it possible? How, you know, I remember the first time I, 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 I heard you talk about this and read about this and the way that you presented it compelling spot on the money it's it, it's 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 excellent and it's great research but okay but how in the hell how could they possibly know this how well, as i said you have to take at face value their statement that somebody who understood the subject told them about it that's really the only way they could know it you can't, can't expect uh uh, what's essentially a primitive African tribe, you know, that, that has no access to technology at all right. to figure this stuff out. You might imagine that maybe a, a shaman could get into the right mental state to, to you know, um, have a vision, access, yeah, right, right. You know, the Akashic records or something, and turn up this information, um, right. and that sort of thing. In the traditions, this is based on might happen, but that's not the way the Dogans say they got this. The Dogans say that somebody who knew all about it deliberately taught it to them. And that that's what the system of symbols is about that has survived in culture after culture, you know, the archetypes of Jung, that those symbols are all part of the system, symbolic system that describes how uh, stages of creation happen. Now, when you look at the symbolism side of it, and then I want to, we'll go back to uh, where we were, but when you look at the symbolism of it and, and having you describe and walk everybody through it, you go, okay, well, that, that makes sense, and that can only be what we think that it is now, right? This, That's right. This same symbolism wasn't only limited to the Dogen as well. It was like somebody was teaching many cultures the same information. That's right, and that um, it's by comparing the same symbol or myth or ritual between cultures that you start to triangulate it on what the truth has to be. Because if you have four different cultures who essentially understand the same concept the same way, you pretty much have a lock on what the concept meant. And now we go into the crazy area where uh, it's uh, the fundamental question is, okay, well, who was doing the teaching? And we can, we can cross-reference these symbols and the cultures and, and come up with some dates and we're looking at some crazy dates, you know, millennia BC uh, <laughs> situations here. So who had this fantastical information and did it come from above? Was it, uh, you know what I mean? We, we are getting into a crazy area here, but That's it's, right. the, but it's That's the only right. answer. Well, and 
There's a tradition in Islam called the Bridge of Sarah that says that the truth is going to be found on a razor's edge between essentially science and superstition. And in other words, it doesn't matter how you approach this, what your mindset is coming at it, scientific or superstitious, that you're going to have to take a st one or two steps out of your comfort zone to be able to get at what the actual truth of it's going to be, because it's going to lie somewhere in between the two. Um, the uh, Both the Dogen and the Buddhists, who share a common symbolic system, only given in different languages, they both agree that they got it from a non-human source. Um, and you're tempted to think, well, you know, uh, stars like Sirius are so so important to this tradition. We must be talking about, you know, UFO aliens, sci-fi type aliens that came from Sirius and taught this stuff. But that's not really the way it plays out with these guys. The Dogen say they're talking about something more exotic than that. Um, if you follow this tradition back to its beginnings, there are philosophies that underlie this stuff. And in the philosophy, the cosmological philosophy, they're saying universes form in pairs. One of them is non-material, and one of them is material. And the Dogen are saying, are claiming, that the teachers who gave them this information were originally non-material, and then somehow materialized and were able to take action in our in our world frame and teach these things to the Dogen. We've got one about, the, well, one, uh, really quick before, uh, uh, I've got to hit a break here in 60 seconds. So we'll pick okay. up right here when we come back. But let me ask you this. Uh, the, you can give me the short answer. How comfortable were you stepping outside of the box? Because this was a big step to the left or the right for anybody. But this is your research. How comfortable were you with that? My inclination was not to, but... There are certain rules I follow as a researcher that if I'm true to those rules, it forces me to consider it. And I'll explain after the break what that, how that works. And that's why you are Laird Scranton and we are not. <laughs> Let me be very <laughs> clear. All right. Our guest tonight, Laird Scranton. Yeah, we are going old school tonight. We're going to get our knowledge on lost history, the Dogen. We're going to talk about the gods of Egypt, the Maori in New Zealand, his new upcoming book. All of that right after this short break. Stay with us. Our guest, Laird Scranton on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. I'll be right back. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, The Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Hello, I'm Katie, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're, We're the Honey Brothers. Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Oh, okay. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. Ancient Life Oil. Life-changing. The real oil. CBD is truly ancient life oil from the source. This oil has no psychoactive effect and is also legal in all 50 states. When you're healthy, you're happy. The truth about this wonderful plant is that it wants to give back to mankind. Life, longevity, and happiness. Ancient life oil are golden grade. All organic, non-GMO, and infused with high-quality liquid coconut oil. It's simple. Just go to ancient ancientlifeoil.com today that's ancientlifeoil.com the best purest organic and non-gmo cbd in the world go back lee tappy the statements made regarding these products have not been evaluated by the food and drug administration these products are not intended to diagnose treat cure or prevent any disease please consult your healthcare professional about potential interactions or other possible complications before using any product what's up fader knots 
Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full range boom boxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this, it's amazing. It's just 129 bucks and use the promo code JCRTWS and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple, just go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner, go back Lee Tappy. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Laird Scranton. We are going through lost history. It is my favorite subject, I got to tell you. Now, I'm going to go straight back uh, to where we uh, left off there, Laird. Uh, When we are talking about uh, symbolism and ancient Egypt and the Dogen and some of the things that you were putting together that that was occurring on the atomic level. I want everybody to, to grasp this concept here. You made that uh, connection also with um, ancient Egypt and some of their symbolism was directly, directly correlating back with what the Dogen were doing. And uh, I want to talk about that for a second because we are going back, you know, 5,000 years. That's right. Well, um, w- the the central question we were were uh, discussing was whether there could be non-human influences here. The the Dogen are saying there were, and the Buddhists are saying that there were. Now, the situation I'm in as a researcher is I've got two matching symbolic systems given in two different languages: one in Sanskrit, the other in ancient Egyptian words, essentially, and that implies that neither culture just learned about their system from the other one. There wasn't a direct transmission. Otherwise, it wouldn't mean a different la- everything wouldn't mean a different language. Right. So both are have legitimate claim to be ancient. The Buddhist system was documented by about 400 BC, and the Dogen system is given in words that went out of use by around 750 BC, but really tie back farther than that. In my mind, they tie back to about 3000 BC. Right. Now, what that means is two separate cultures managed to keep this complicated system of symbols straight for thousands of years. Because when you when you read about what a modern authority on Buddhism says, there he's describing a system that's a, the same close match for the Dogen system that I'm talking about. In other words, for those two systems to match after thousands of years, neither one of them can have changed substantially over those thousand-year periods of time. If they had, they wouldn't still match. So as a researcher, uh, we've also got both cultures saying that they got it from a non-human source. So now, as a researcher, that puts me in a hard position. I have two choices, basically. I can presume that both cultures managed to keep all these intimate details straight for thousands of years, but somehow forgot who they got the system from. Possible. Not, but not just forgot it. But forgot it in, in matching ways. They misremembered it in the same way as each other. Or I can take the stance that they can't get that detail straight to and the, that that implies that I have to consider that they're telling me the truth about that. They're in agreement about it. I have to at least allow the possibility or consider the possibility that a non human source was involved because there's such intimate agreement between these two systems. I tried to explain that at one point. Uh, Graham ha- Hancock had um, asked for people to give him his, the, their best shot as to why we have to consider um, non-human influences in this ancient stuff, ancient mysteries tradition. And, I, and that was the explanation I gave him, that 
you can't have both cultures remembering it that way and not at least consider the possibility. And what about what? Okay, so we have the possibility of uh, maybe something from the stars. Okay, let's let's uh, well, let's put that on the side for a second. A little side burner. We'll let that simmer. What about okay. another uh, civilization? Before I drop the A word and go Atlantis, but we don't necessarily have to go there. <clears throat> but a previous culture that uh, handed the information down, and it was earthbound information. Well, um, it's a tricky perspective on that. Um, the nature of the information, some of this information is is describing such things as what preceded the Big Bang and what universes look like from the broad picture at looking outside in. Right. These are these are topics that only a space capable civilization could have known about. So in the end, we're either talking about a space capable um, culture from without where we are, or else a space capable culture from within where we are. Right. If we're talking about an Atlantis, this is the level of knowledge that implies that they were space capable. Right. So it really doesn't matter. It's a moot question to me whether we're dealing with space alien type capabilities here or not, whether it's earthbound or whether it's not earthbound, somebody had that same capability. It's a moot point to me. But the fact of the matter is that as we get down the line, I'm, I'm, um, I've written a couple of books ahead of where I've published at this point. Um, when we get down to the, the bottom of what I've researched so far, you end up with an umbe- umbrella perspective really allows things to be true that there's involvement with a, a pre ice age culture that was decimated like Atlantis but there's also involved uh, that that uh, that culture is also connected to the non material influences that the Dogan's talking about the, it's hard to explain no no it's not and this is this is what is trippy for me is that the it, and it's the obvious which is the the talk of binary star systems and even even planetary systems out there and exoplanets this is all modern knowledge this is stuff that we we didn't even start to grasp the concept of binary star systems until just recently and when we're talking right. about four and a half billion years on Earth, right, and and, and modern history, let's let's just say three thousand BC to now, it's five thousand years. That is an infinitesimal amount of time. That when you right. look at the now uh, the the age of the Earth, right? It it it's right. Infin- it, it, this is modern 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 knowledge and information that. The scientist and astrologer today had to be convinced that this was actual. And now, in the last 10 years, it is now the accepted norm that most sci- uh, most star systems are binary. It, but this is knowledge that these cultures have had for a long, long time. That right. flips me out, and that's where it must have come from the stars, this information. It had to come from off-planet. Well, but if you think that we've come to this level of understanding in say 12,000 years at most. Right. And that the length that humanity has been on the planet is many, many, many times that. It's hard to imagine that in some other 12,000 year span of modern humanity that some other group didn't come to the same point. And and, and, and do a drive-by. Right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, for, the, for the Dogen, um, what we start getting down to is in is in some really complicated questions about motivations. Um, what would motivate somebody to establish a system like the symbolic esoteric system? What would what could possibly have been their motivation other than just altruism to help us out? Right, 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 right. Um, so part of what the later books get down to is an understanding that's that's agreed upon by multiple groups. You see it in Kabbalism, you see it in Buddhism, you see it in the Dogen culture, you see it in ancient uh, traditions of India, you see it other places around the planet. 
a, a common perspective on what the motivation, the original motivations were for um, creating this instructed tradition. Um, you might think that it comes down to um, an altruistic effort, like a FEMA effort, to help us recover from a disaster like such as the ice, ice age imposed on us. Right. The ice age really knocked us back to zero. And so just following the Ice Age, now suddenly you have a group coming in that looks an awful lot like FEMA in terms of what they're doing, helping us relearn basic skills of agriculture, helping us relearn basic concepts of science, helping us structure um, cities and, and uh, countries or the idea of nations and so forth, put governments in place and things like that. Um, so you can you can approach it from that standpoint and say it looks this looks like a, a humanitarian effort and on one level that's what it is, but when you get down to the really bottom motivations, it turns out that there is a compelling mutual interest that um, if you accept the idea that there is a non-material universe that's paired with the material universe and that that non-material universe is characterized as having perfect knowledge, perfect intelligence, whereas we're characterized as having imperfect knowledge. They're characterized as having no ability to act in their own frame, while we have perf perfect ability to act in our frame. You go to the ancient philosophies, and what they're saying is there are routine attempts being made from this non-material side to induce actions on the material side. If you believe the concept of the Yuga cycle, that humanity goes through cycles of being able to perceive and not perceive this non-material realm. You know, connection to the spiritual or the non-material gets greater for a period of time and then it becomes less and less and less and less and then it gets, starts to get greater and greater and greater, greater again. Right. Going through a cycle. Then you understand that maybe humanity did have ways of having access to this knowledge. In the Dogen case, they're not talking about a spiritual experience. They're talking about a physical instruction. But you can understand how a body of, of knowledge that we were right on top of back in ancient times, somehow over time we've lost. <laughs> and that's sort of what this this cycle of, um, of transmission is connected to. You have people like Walter Crutton talking about how can that happen. Um, he's, he's imagining that there's a force that draws our, our solar system closer and farther away from a galactic center and that there are electromagnetic effects from being closer and farther away from that center mm -hmm. that enhance the capabilities of people. Now, the the other part for this that really starts to fascinate me, when we're talking about the atomic level, our knowledge of, and especially when I was growing up, and you, you're, we're about the same age, you're a little older than I am, but as when we went through school, the smallest thing there is is the atom, right? That, right. That's it. That's it. And now we know that obviously that's not true, but, <laughs> but, the, but the, and, and how, and what was inside of an atom and how it actually worked is still puzzling us today, but uh, ripping it apart, we're finding out that there's all kinds of smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller things there. Every time we find something small, there's something inside of that that's even smaller. Right. The Dogen had this knowledge. Okay, great. But why did they have this knowledge and what could they have done with it? Well, I can tell you one of the reasons they had the knowledge, from my point of view, is, be, okay, first of all, the information, is, as you said, is aimed at a target audience that was technological, thousands of years in the future from when the information was presented. They are focused on an, uh, an audience that has to have enough awareness to know what an atom is and to know what the components of an atom are. But when you get to that audience, which in this case is us, yes. That entire structure of matter, we can verify from waves all the way up to the atom. That's great. That's stuff the, the Dogen shouldn't possibly know, but we can absolutely verify is on the money. They got it right. They, there's no question. They're reciting the alphabet of matter in the, in the correct way. The same as a four-year-old, if they can recite the real alphabet and point to the right letter at the time they recite it, everyone agrees they understand the alphabet. Right. Well, everyone has to agree that the Dogen understand the structure of matter. One purpose of that, from my point of view, is to establish a credential. 
for the source that provided the information. It says, here, look, here's this whole complicated structure that you can absolutely verify is right. Now, we're going to tell you about a whole bunch of really interesting stuff that you're not in a position to absolutely know is right. But because you can see that we knew what we were talking about with this other structure, that gives you the cause to consider, seriously consider, that we know what we're talking about with the rest of this. Have you been able to uh, look at some of the symbolism from, we've talked about cultures, but what about the Native Americans? What about uh, here in the United States? Any symbolism there? Have you? It's, it's to- all the same stuff. Um, okay, if we talk about a Buddhist stupa, which is a shrine, a symbolic shrine that's a grand symbol of this tradition, any culture that has a stupa it, it was affected by the same tradition. The dog would have one. Um well, in Siberia and Mongolia, there's a portable kind of a stupa. It's called a yurt. has all the same symbolism right. and a lot of the same structures. And there are four different types of styles of yurt. The most complicated yurt is a match for a Navajo roundhouse, both in structure and symbolism. The simplest kind of yurt is called a teepee, and it's a match for a Native American teepee. So this is absolutely, that's a signature, that there's absolutely a connection between Siberia and Mongolia and North America in terms of these structures. Uh, And the architecture proves it. Now, when we start to look at this, and I'm so fascinated with, uh, it's simple to look at megalithic structures because, first off, they're big. Second, they're beautiful, and we always look at them and wonder, okay, how the heck did they do that? And so, you you know, that megalithic stuff seems to be up up front and talked about as it should, right? But when you look at all of the different types of uh, architecture, doorways, windows, steps, roofs, construction, teepees, yurts, uh, around the world, they either... These cultures are communicating with each other and sharing this knowledge, or there is a progenitor that's at the top of the tree where everything is originating from. What do you think? Was it communication between the cultures and some kind of transoceanic communication going on back then, or did they just have one teacher from above? Well, there was a little of both going on, but the essential piece of it, from my point of view, is they had a common teacher who was teaching them the same information in substantially the same way. Um, If we can uh, divert uh, our discussion for just a minute, you were talking about megalithic structures. Yes. Um, I'm scheduled to take a a small tour group to Orkney Island. Um, I'm going to lead a tour in the middle of September, from September 14th to the 23rd. Scarabray. Uh, going to Orkney. Scarabray oh. and all of the megalithic structures that are there. And as part of that, I'm going to be able to actually give a presentation on my Scarabray book in a hotel on Orkney Island to people who live on Orkney Island. Oh, man. A great opportunity for me to try to, to bounce this information off of people. I want to go. There happen to be a, <laughs> a couple of slots still open on the tour um, if – there's anyone who wants to join it. There's, it's not too late to join up with it. Where, um, where it's going to happen one way or the other. Yeah, where's that information for everybody? Um, best way to find it would be to contact me on Facebook. Okay. Um, I, I periodically post it on Facebook. Um, this is a, a tour company that approached, approached me about leading a tour. Um, I'm doing it basically for uh, as long as my expenses are covered. I'm just doing it. Gratis. That same thing with the presentation on Orkney. It's a, a free event or open to the public for people to come in and learn about this stuff or talk about this stuff. Well, so um, talking about Orkney, let's let's kind of stay on Scarabray for a second. Do you have uh, some more developments? Absolutely. There are some really interesting things. First of all, um, my perspective is that we have a cosmological tradition that started at Gobekli Tepe in that era at the on 10,000 BC, and that was centered primarily in the Fertile Crescent, moved south from there, and moved actually ended up moving in all directions from there. Um, on Orkney, you have signs that the Orkney Island tradition came out of that same tradition. One of the signs is a unique variety of barley, it's unique in the UK, only to Orkney Island, it doesn't exist anyplace else, but the DNA shows that it originated in the Fertile Crescent around 6,000 BC. Now, there's also a variety of sheep called the Orkney sheep, whose DNA points to the same same location in the same era. 
there's a variety of mouse or vole who I don't have positive DNA proof, but I have uh, circumstantial inf information to suggest that it came out of the same region. It only exists in Turkey, down into Palestine, on the tip of North Africa, and on Orkney Island. So it almost traces a path by, oh, by sea for whoever came to Orkney Island. And it had to be by sea, right? I mean, it just had to be. There's... I mean, well, the, the last step had to be to get onto Orkney Island. Uh, the transmission could have been by land across Europe, but they've done testing of this mouse, this bull across Europe, and they don't find a match. Right. Uh, so that suggests that it didn't. Now, in addition to that, there is a, what was considered to be a later, from a, a somewhat later era, a set of a group a burial chamber where they find skulls that were severely damaged on the top and bodies that were dismembered and burned. And it's always been interpreted that this is evidence of an attack on the island, that these people were were uh, attacked and killed and, and their bones thrown into this burial chamber. But in fact, all of the details of this burial chamber line up with a ritualized burial method that existed for the Shakti cult in that same region of the Fertile Crescent and in, down into India that I tie everything else to. So it's, it's in agreement. Uh, my difficulty was that the way the symbolism plays out, it implies that it happened in an earlier era, maybe a thousand years earlier than the traditional researchers think. Well, just recently a study came out saying, guess what? We've discovered that some of this stuff had to have happened thousands of years before when we traditionally thought it happened. My vision of things is this, and I'm just a doofus, okay? So I'm not coming but uh, uh, from any point of uh, education. But this is how I kind of see this starting to play out here, is uh, if we start at Gobekli Tepe and we go back to 10,000 B.C., 12,000 B.C., uh, whatever that dating turns out to be, but it seems like everything is going to fan out from there by foot headed south into the Fertile Crescent, into uh, uh, Iraq and, and down through Egypt, across uh, northern Africa. Maybe boats get involved here out of the Mediterranean and then back up. But I think everything is going to start. Uh, uh, Gobekli Tepe is going to be at the center of the wagon wheel. Right. Now, one of the translations for the word name, Gobekli Tepe, is Central Hill. Yep. Now, that's the same translation that applies to the suffix opolis in Greece. And their temples were traditionally placed on central hills. So we have that kind of a connection that implies that Gobekli Tepe may have been situated where it was because it was central to all these other regions. It was sort of in the center of land masses. Yeah, and it was visible from everywhere. Right. And, and we, can all, we can trace their DNA studies, studies of civilizing skills and so forth that, all, that move in all directions from there. You can process uh, language. You can follow um, uh, you know, animal husbandry types of uh, livestock, things like that, in all directions and see that it fans out from that Fertile Crescent region. Um, so... Uh, it, that ends up follow, um, following a path that goes as far south through India as, and as far east and south as Australia. Uh, you have evidence um, connected with Australia of what originally was a matriarchal condition, uh, tradition. Um, the Shakti cult is a matriarchal tradition. And there's, there are symbolic reversals that go on along here that are, are interesting in terms of the Orkney find. Um, the ritual through the Shakti cult suggests that the top of the head was being deliberately opened ritually for symbolic purposes. Now, in, the, in traditions in India, the idea is that if a, for a person's um, energy to ascend after they die, it needs to emerge from the top of their head. So there's a, a sensible symbolism here to opening up the top of the head to allow that ascension to happen. But then, midway through this, ten, um, this period, starting at 10,000 BC, you see uh, symbolic reversals happen in a lot of different ways. The same symbolism that I see applying to the opening up of the head in archaic times is what applies to the opening of the mouth of the mummy in Egypt in later times. Now, to support that idea, we go to the word 
that the Egyptians use to describe the opening of the mouth ceremony, and it's written with two glyphs. The first glyph is a glyph that symbolizes the crown of the skull, and the second one is a glyph that represents a mouth. So we have the concept of these two things linked together in relation to that tradition in the Egyptian word itself. Now, I'm going to flip you out. We're going to head towards a break, but I want your reaction on this. In Armenian, okay, in Armenian, you know what Gobekli Tepe uh, translates to? No, what's that? Umbilical cord. Oh, <laughs> very interesting. Yes, <laughs> and and you can also stretch it out a little bit. Uh, navel, navel, you know, the same thing. Uh, yeah, same thing in Turkish, it's hill with a navel. Yeah, hill with a navel, navel mountain. Isn't that a trip? <laughs> I mean, it's Very weird, isn't it? And and if we start to look at all of this, how it's starting to play out here, um, I just feel that now uh, that Gobekli Tepe is going to become more and more significant. That's my opinion. But um, in the Thank recent, right. yeah, in the recent little uh, uh, flare up uh, over on the Joe Rogan show with uh, uh, with Graham and and Randall Carlson, those guys are. Uh, backing up a little bit and apologizing for their um, uh, that they got a little angry on the show. I said to I said to Graham and I really you didn't get angry enough, you know, in, in my opinion. <laughs> but 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 they were also backing off a little bit um, when we were the suggestions of uh, a high technology culture was was around before Gobekli Tepe. And I disagree. You know, I think um, either they've that that's the position that they want to stick with, or um, that there wasn't, or maybe that they don't want to defend that position. But I I really think that there was something behind Gobekli Tepe that was pretty strong and upright and very technological. Well, I'm in agreement with you, and as I said, that from from my point of view, there's an umbrella perspective over both viewpoints, the idea of a, of a high ancient culture and the idea of a sort of a FEMA uh, recovery effort after a disaster. Um, I, I actually had messaged Graham at one point and said, look, I can explain to you the details of how this umbrella perspective works. It would take me about an afternoon to, to justify it to you. Right, right. But there, there is a perspective there that, that upholds the viewpoint that he has, but it requires him to take – a step outside of his comfort zone and embrace the Buddhist and the Dogen perspective of a non-material influence. Yeah, and my problem with Graham is this. when Whenever I talk to him about these subjects directly, I can't argue with him. His accent kicks in, and he's suddenly <laughs> he's the smart guy in the room, right? And I just I yell uncle, and I give up. Let's take a break right here, Laird. Fantastic conversation. When we come back, everybody, Laird and I are going to discuss the ancient gods of Egypt. We're going to jump right there, and there's a lot of symbolism involved in all of his research. We'll do that when we come back. It's Fade to Black. Our guest, Laird Scranton. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. We'll be right back. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk. Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRA Radio.com. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Hello, Fader Knots. This is Jimmy Church, and I'm introducing New Pharma, a company whose products are based on science. Human function based on the endocannabinoid system, or ECS. New Pharma firmly believes in this science, and their research indicates that support of the ECS provides the beneficial effects for a healthy lifestyle. New Pharma's science includes relief capsules for pain relief, Sleep capsules, which are natural support for occasional sleeplessness. Foundation is support for your ECS, and Fit capsules support your active lifestyle. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2B for a 33% discount on all of their products. 
or visit newpharma.com for all of the knowledge on the science. That's gnupharma.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Hi, I'm Matt Ray for U.S. Gold Bureau. I cover the market daily. No matter how strong it gets or what long-term predictions say, you can count on one thing as certain. There will be another crash. It will affect your assets. And when it happens... Wouldn't you rather be two weeks or even two months ahead of the curve? Well, Wall Street insiders have been quietly converting their assets into gold for the last few years. Now it's your turn. Buying gold and silver is easier than buying stocks. With the U.S. Gold Bureau's Investor Guide, it's free, and you learn how to buy precious metals in or out of an IRA or 401k retirement plan. Your investment shipped directly to your home and is 100% insured and guaranteed. You control your investments and shelter them against the stock market politics and unknown threats. Act while your dollar is still worth something. Call U.S. Gold Bureau, 800-885-GOLD. U.S. Gold Bureau, 800-885-GOLD. 800-885-GOLD. Call today. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) KGRARadio.com. Hi folks, CBD is the home run hitter for health right now. Why you ask? Because of what it does for the body. Unfortunately, I can't tell you all about the benefit. You know, there's reasons. Do your due diligence and log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. Ancient Life Oil uses organic ingredients and is blended in coconut oil for some of the best benefits. Legal in 50 states and non-psychoactive. Log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Laird Scranton. Getting our knowledge on. This is how you do it. This is how you get your degree in lost history. You listen to Fade to Black, you listen to me, and you get your education on. All right? It's just three hours on this show, and you get... I'll send it to you. Email me. I'll print something out. I'll give you, I'll give you your own degree. Laird, this is one one of the things that isn't talked about enough is the the gods of Egypt. And uh, be- before we step into that, can I uh, insert one thing here? You can insert uh, I, whatever. I have a you good want. Uh, support team here. My wife Risa, in particular, is always watching out for me, and she brought me the information about that tour. In case anybody's interested. Oh, absolutely. The, uh, the uh, website it's thedestinationcompany.com. dot com. And the name of the tour is Mysteries of Orkney Island Tour. Okay. You know what? Do this for me. Pop that in. Uh, text it to me right now, and I'll get uh, our producers to put it up in Twitter. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. We'll do that. Have Risa type while you talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll do that. <laughs> now, um, and the reason why, it, it, it's it's kind of funny. When, when the the gods of Egypt are brought up, um, it's always in a superficial sense. I, I don't think enough uh, uh, talk goes on about the uh, the gods of Egypt. You know, they'll talk about uh, Amon Ra or or Osiris, and then just kind of let things go. Thoth will kind of come up and let things go. We have the imagery there, but but who they are, what they are, and the symbolism behind it, and what the intentions were, and how ancient they they actually are is not actually talked about. That research is always let go. Why do you think that is? It's the most important part of of uh, ancient Egyptian culture, and it's just not talked about. 
Well, the the symbolism is complicated for a lot of reasons. We got we have influences at different periods of time that um, that make things hard. You have differences in symbolism from locality to locality, and in different eras in Egypt, things changed over time. So it becomes difficult for a researcher who doesn't have some kind of an out, outside source to to hang it on to be able to to focus in on what the actual symbolism is. They had, they have to go by supposition, not by, by direct evidence. Um, I'm fortunate in that I have sort of the, the cheater's copy. I have the teacher's copy of the book, you know, from the fifth grade when you suddenly occurred to you, the reason the teacher had that big thick book is because all the questions to the chapter, you know, all the answers to the chapter questions were in the back of her book. <laughs> well, that, that's sort of what I feel like I have having reference to the Dogen and the, and the Buddhism, uh, references and so forth that you can you can get perspectives on what the symbolism meant um, as an example the Dogen symbols get so complicated that they feel they have to give you a frame of reference to be able to categorize them and one of those frames of reference has to do with the animal kingdom um, there's a sequence a four stage sequence that we're, one an example is um, water fire wind and earth everybody's familiar with those those are four categories for symbols well another one is insects fish um, four legged animals and birds now what that reference tells us is it places it categorizes where the symbolism falls for any given reference in the animal kingdom if you have Kepper, who is the, the dung beetle, who represents um, non-existence coming into existence, that four-stage sequence tells you that that symbolism should fall at the beginning stages of matter, and it does. Thoth, who has the head of a bird, has symbolism that based on that sequence would have to fall at the in the last of the four stages. The last of the four stages is closer to an atom, and the first of the four stages is closer to waves. And so, based on these Dogen references, you can predict, based on what kind of a head the Egyptian god has, what their symbolism represented, or at least where it fell. You know that Anubis, who has the head of a four-legged animal, a dog, or a, um, a jackal, um, has got a fall in the third stage of that symbolism. And for the Dogen, it does. That's fascinating. You know, and that takes things to a whole nother level, if you start to think about it, is there was some communication going back and forth or from one direction to the other. Maybe it was one way, but the influences are certainly there. And to have this kind of communication going back quite possibly before there was language, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you know right. what I it mean. Is. Oh, definitely it does. The The oral uh, cosmology is, is understood, traditionally understood to a preceded written language. Um, to give you another example of why the traditional researchers don't pick up on this stuff, there's a researcher named uh, Phyllis Granoff, who was a professor at Yale. And she stumbled on ancient Indian text, textual references to Ganesha, to what's uh, described as eight incarnations of Ganesha. Now, she could tell, based on the way the literature is laid out, that it was supposed to represent progressive stages of creation. The problem was she didn't have any frame of reference to be able to understand what they were talking about. She just knew these incarnations of Ganesha relate to stages of creation. When you go to the Dogen culture, you have this spiraling structure of matter, which they call the Po Pilu. The word Pilu in many of these ancient colors means elephant. This is the, the, the atom of the elephant is one of the literal translations for this spiral. The, the Dogen descriptions of the eight stages of this spiral of matter line right up with those eight incarnations of Ganesha. And so when you put the two together, you can say, ah, oh, look, here's what Ganesha represents. Cosmologically speaking, Ganesha's symbolism relates to this spiral of matter. When we look at, what about set? Is there a set relationship with the Dogen? Uh, the, the easiest way to to sort out the symbolism, if if you don't have a direct Dogen statement about something, the way the Egyptian language works, the written words work, they tell you their own meanings. The glyphs are conceptual, primarily. In addition to being phonetic, they're also conceptual. But the game when a scribe was writing an Egyptian word was to find a way to write the right phonetic word 
using symbols that represented the right concept. Right. So when you look at the concept of the, the, the symbols used to write the name of Set, you understand that he really represents um, um, concept, concepts of uh, – let's, let's get this right um, – if we were talking about pet, we were talking about or, or pata, we're talking about concepts of space. Set, um, we're talking about. Let's see here. Well, I mean, for me, it, what what's trippy about set for me is the, you know, the god of the red desert, the orange, the the redness about him. Certainly, there was. Uh, bad things about set. I mean, you know what I mean? A bad, an overall like evil background to this God. That- yeah. This is symbolism that relates to Sati in Hinduism. And definitely this, these are concepts that eventually played out as Satan in right. Christianity. So definitely there's a bad side to it. Um, and that definitely relates to set in Egypt. Um but trying to get down to what that symbolism is, unless you have a comparative view between cultures, it's almost impossible to, to put the pieces together to know what they're really talking about. Um, and it's, it's very much the same thing as you, know, you use a, a view master. You look through a view master and you, because you're looking with two eyes at two different, slightly different views of the same scene, the brain sees a three-dimensional image. It's the same way with these comparative uh, relationships between cultures, when you can see two or more of them from slightly different points of view, you get a three-dimensional picture of what they're talking about. And then when we have Anubis, you know, head of a jackal, head of a dog, uh, it, that to me is one thing. But today, especially in pop culture, uh, it it's an evil, I mean, it, it represents death and it re- represents darkness when it, in reality, it was actually one of the cooler gods there. It didn't represent anything bad or everybody welcome because it was taking you to the other side. This guy was going to assist you after you died. And and it was one of the one of the more respected and cooler gods of ancient Egypt. Right. I agree. Um, the Egyptian underworld relates to what the Dogen call the second world of matter. Now, the first world of matter is waves. The second world happens when an act of perception disturbs that perfectly ordered wave and causes it to go through a bunch of gyrations that reconfigure it. And that reconfiguring process is what um, Anubis is connected with. And so to be able to reconfigure it, it's like cleaning out a closet. To, to clean up a mess, you got to make a mess. Right. And so Anubis ends up being associated with, with the destructive side of that because you, you're, he's making the mess first before he cleans it up. But it's a, a process of reordering. And that reordering is the process that a soul supposedly goes through when it's reborn. And, and see, that that's the whole uh, – the – uh, the patrolling of the afterlife, you know, Anubis walking around and, and taking care of that world. Also, uh, w- it was a positive thing, but he was black because of the Nile. Let's you know, people think that today in pop culture that he was black because he was evil. So you have the head of the jackal, you have this big black, you know, cosmologically, he was black because what he's doing precedes the uh, appearance of light in. Uh, the material world and everything. So, yeah. So he's happy. The things he's doing are being done in the dark. And so, and, and in reality, Anubis was one of the coolest gods, you know, ever, right? One of the coolest. It just scares right. the crap out of people today. He shows up and he represents evil somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> somewhere we went down the I wrong mean, path. Some researchers, including John West and, and some other Robert Temple who um, have have surmised, could the Sphinx have orig- originally represented Anubis? Could it have been uh, shaped like a dog rather than a lion? And that sort of makes sense mythologically. There are reasons why a person would think that it might be true and the shape of the Sphinx is such that it could allow for it. But when, again, the Egyptian land, question for it because there are only two Egyptian words for the Sphinx, and both of them are written with lion glyphs, one with a pure lion glyph and one with a man-headed lion glyph. And so it's clear that the Egyptian scribes thought that the Sphinx represented a lion. And if anybody would have known, they would have. Well, then we have Sekhmet, right? 
Right. Okay. That's right. Now, Sekhmet also went through some uh, evolutionary changes from cat to lion headed lioness, but was uh, the protector of the pharaohs. Um, right. But, but went from a full feline uh, originally, which a, a, a cat, to in the end being a lion headed goddess. Um, but we have that same symbolism going on throughout uh, ancient Egypt. Right. And um, different aspects of things got emphasized in different places, and as I said, in different eras. And so it's hard to put your finger down and say, here's what the Egyptians thought. You really have to say, what did they think at 3000 BC in Abydos? Or what did they think you know, in later times at some other location? Yeah, and she was one of the original gods, you know, daughter of Ra, and again, the protector of the pharaohs, and uh, it depends on if you're dealing with the old, middle, new kingdom, uh, Romans, Greek, or the original uh, uh, dynasties going backwards, she was always there, but was represented uh, differently. Do you think that they, and, and also, this is something else that's really strange for me. Why isn't Sekhmet talked about like maybe Thoth or Osiris or Amun-Ra are? She is one of the original gods and very, very important in ancient Egypt, but is not talked about in, in research today. Well, this has to do with the symbolic reversals I've talked about. These reversals, you can see them happen cross-culturally at about the same era. If you imagine that we have an era that begins in 10,000 BC um, and moves forward to our time, which would be for a per period of about 12,000 years, somewhere about halfway through that process, say around 4,000 BC or just after, in culture after culture, you have these reversals happening. Um, one of the big ones, the obvious ones is, that rather than having goddesses or a matriarchy being the dominant thing, suddenly you have gods and patriarchy being the dominant thing. By the time you get to Egypt at 3000 BC, patriarchy is starting to be the rule. Right. And so the modern Egyptologists who are looking at a patriarchal system and, and understanding it that way are sort of relegating the goddesses to a lesser position than they had in ancient times when it was matriarchal or archaic times. Very interesting. I wanted to uh, also, I, I know this is a bit strange, but go with me here. I want to talk about skin colors. Okay. When, when, <laughs> now, Egyptologists are going to tell you one thing, and they have developed this uh, dogma. I'm going to go with dogma. I think that's the right word um, over the years. But when I see a Cyrus, I see alien okay i see and it's an obvious thing because i'm talking about skin color here but i i nobody wants to talk about the elephant in the room we have a deaf they they knew what they were painting they knew what they were representing they knew what the the visuals that they were creating here and to have skin color off right. like that to me says something and they want to read something else into it. Do you think that there is an alien connection to, to a god like Osiris? Um, that's a hard question to answer. Now, many of the things that happened to Osiris as a god in Egypt also happened to Sati as a goddess coming out of an earlier tradition. In, in, in the archaic tradition that feeds Buddhism and Hinduism, it's the equivalent. Okay. Okay, Laird, you need to repeat all of that. You dropped out. Okay. Um, that many of the the things that happened to Osiris in Egypt are also things that, in a more archaic era, happened to a female goddess Sati, or who became Sati in 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 Hinduism. Um, she's the one who is killed and her body is dismembered and her body parts spread across the land and every place a piece of her body fell was the site of a, became the site of a shrine. That symbolism carries forward and there's a triad in Hinduism between Sati and Shiva and Ganesha that li lines up with Osiris 
and Isis and Horus in Egypt. It's the exact so, same story. Yeah, pretty much the exact same story. Right. A lot of the same details. So we can't really analyze things in terms of Osiris because Osiris is an evolved version of what the original story said. This is part of my problem is trying to get back to the earliest form of any given reference that I can find because you don't get to the truth of it until you get to that early form. Yeah, the only difference in the story uh, or the myth or whatever you want to call it is is the missing penis. So that part doesn't really apply. Well, I don't know. We could argue Sati was missing a penis. <laughs> <laughs> Laird Scrat. That was good. That was good. That was good. You're on top of your game. Um, the uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk when we're talking about some of this crazy knowledge uh, uh, that was around back then, I'm talking about of the scientific kind, where we have uh, these gods with animal heads. Again, I don't want to go out with a reach here, but these things are done deliberately. Is there a possibility that maybe these gods were accurate in their depictions? That they did that we were looking at some kind of cloning or 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 crazy surgical processes or different species or 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 but maybe it just uh, wasn't symbolism. I, I can I can talk to that. Um in the earliest form back at, go, go back to Tepe, um, the tradition that came out of that, the Shakti cult, is an aniconic tradition. What that means is they didn't anthropomorphize, they didn't make anthropomorphized images, human images of their deities. They had certain iconic objects that were symbolic for them, like standing stones and stone circles um, and clay pots and things like that. Right. But they didn't have deities who were anthropomorphized and they had symbolic images that were animals that argu arguably represented stages of cos cosmological stages and processes that's how they survived for the dogen now you get farther down in the tradition in india and the animal becomes the iconic um determiner determinative of the deity you have uh, you were talking about there being many different represents, representations of Sekhmet in Egypt. In India, you can have thousands of the same goddess under thousands of different names in different localities. And the way that you sort out who they're really talking about is what animal is she associated with. And uh, if you could point to the, uh, the animal, that tells you ultimately, in terms of any other frame of reference, who are they talking about? Um, so the animals for me are symbolic. Um, now, having said that, there is also a dimensionality at play in here and a translation that's dimensional at play here. We know that if a person takes ayahuasca, let's say, that they can have visions where they see animal-headed beings. And the symbolism of those animal-headed beings, from what I understand, or for, from what I've heard, aligns with um, the ancient symbolism for the same animal. Larry, can I get you to back off of your mic just a little bit? Okay, yeah, yeah just getting a little, a little breathy. Um, Sorry about that. No, that, but that is also very interesting. I have uh, when uh, when I talk about things like cave paintings or or hieroglyphics or uh, the different symbolism around the world, somebody out there some artisan that is taking the time to carve to write to paint to try to preserve this message for future generations was very important to them to take time out of their day like this instead of hunting and feeding and and survival that they needed to take great care about what they were presenting to us and yes. so when i see some of these animal depictions half human half animal de depictions that quite possibly it was exactly what they were seeing and they were uh making sure that it was very accurate now it turns into right. oral traditions and and things that that were handed down from the past but yet they were seeing something now could it have been hallucinogenics and that's possible too as well yeah. it, it absolutely could have been because we know that these cultures were very capable with the the pharmacology the plants and so forth in their um 
their surroundings. They, they understood what plant did what thing. And so absolutely we could have drug-induced images. Uh, from my standpoint, what those drugs are doing is um, a, adjusting perception in a certain way. Uh, even um, with something as simple, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the, a Passover Seder. During a Passover Seder in Judaism, uh, the participants are required to drink four glasses of wine. Now, the number four symbolically is a dimensional number. Our, our universe, by the, for, according to the Dogen, is represented as the fourth of seven universes. And that number relates to four dimensions. We have uh, three linear dimensions and we have time. The symbolism of those glasses of wine in Judaism is that each one takes you a step, dimensional step away from a strict material perspective. Right, and when you move through those perspectives, in at least one of those perspectives, you're—I'm imagining you're seeing this um, animal symbolism, and you may actually see it. It may actually be a translated uh, the way that certain images translate from that dimensional image. And um, yeah, and I agree. And the other part is some of the animal depictions when we're talking about the ancient uh, or talking about the gods of Egypt are inaccurate they're almost general right it could be this it could be the head of the it could be that it could be both it could be just the but it's not accurate and that, that i find that right. curious too as well i mean what were they seeing well the cubit as a unit of measure is an interesting unit of measure because it's not a um it, it, it it's a relative unit of measure, not a precise one. That different cultures had different lengths of cubits. Now, there's a reason for that, and it's because what the cubit was originally used to measure was the geometry that aligns these shrines. It's sacred geometry, basically. But the geometry works based on the relative relationship of the images, not their actual size. So it doesn't matter if I draw one that's a little bigger than yours the relationship of the images still produces the result we want. So you didn't need a precise measure where everybody's ruler measured the exactly the same size foot or yard. All you needed was a consistent unit of measure that would relatively measure these, these distances. And so I think the same thing is going on there, that these images are relative, not precise. And that's a concept that that is foreign to a scientific mindset. In the scientific mindset, if you can't measure it to five decimal positions, you don't have anything. Very interesting. Let's take a break right here. When we come back, I'm going to hit, I'm, this is what you're going to think about. I want your answer. When we come back after this break, the question is, what came first, the Great Pyramid or Gobekli Tepe? I'm muting you now, Laird. Don't answer. Think about that. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Laird Scranton. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER, stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation, and angioprim is the result. A safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now for a special radio offer from angioprim. That's angioprim.com slash radio. A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M. Angioprim.com slash radio or call 877-882-7221. That's 877-882-7221. 
So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on the smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com Do you worry a lot? If you're forgetful, nervous, moody, or overwhelmed, chances are you're not protecting yourself from the ravaging effects of stress and anxiety. No matter the cause, ongoing stress and elevated levels of the stress hormone cortisol can rob your memory, your health, your quality of life, and your future. Now you can combat the effects of stress and anxiety while improving your memory and recall at the same time with the dietary supplement Calm and Clever. Studies show that the ingredients in Calm and Clever reduce cortisol by as much as 30% in as little as one to two weeks and increase your ability to recall facts, names, and numbers in four to 12 weeks. Calm and Clever was created by scientist Kurt Hendricks, a principal investigator in two NIH-funded studies on Alzheimer's disease. Try Calm and Clever for two months. You'll feel the difference. Call 1-800-758-8746 or go to calmandclever.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony, damn it! This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back, Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Laird Scranton. Always a great animated conversation with with Laird. I learn something every time he's on the show. I'm not kidding about this. That's why I do this. I, I walk away from shows like this, Laird. I'm just a little bit smarter. I'm just a little smarter than than than, than before the show. Um, what what came first, man? What what, what do you think came first, Gobekli Tepe or the Great the, Pyramid? This, uh- there's actually a very easy answer to that, a way to understand what the answer is that has to do with the symbols and the symbolic reversals I'm talking about. Um, in At 3000 BC, in various cultures, China, Egypt, other places, Africa, the shape of a circle was symbolic of the non-material or the heavens. The shape of a square was symbolic of the earth. In archaic times, the symbolism was the reverse of that, that the square represented the heavens and the circle represented the earth. Now, when we look at uh, a Buddha stupa and the matching shrine that the Dogen build, they are built to the same plan, geometric plan. There's a series of geometric shapes that are evolved in the same sequence with the same symbolism, but the Dogen shrine culminates with a round base and a squared roof, the Buddha stupa culminates with a squared base and a round roof. Now, I know, because of the way those symbolic reversals work, that the base, which represents the Earth, because it's round on the Dogen shrine, that's got to be an earlier symbolic form than the squared Buddha, shrine, Buddha stupa um, shrine form. Okay, okay. Because of the way the reversals happen. Now, I go back to Tepe, what they're placing as their base on the earth are circles, stone circles. That's archaic. In Egypt, 
when they build a pyramid, they're building it with a squared base. That means it has to have been built from a symbolic standpoint sometime after the midpoint of this tradition. Now, you just reversed this on me three times. Okay, so what? Okay, okay so, so be, because Gobekli Tepe has a circular base, and I know that it, it was built during an archaic era, that circle is representative of the earth. And so you see the circle on the earth, defining the earth. You get to Egypt, the base of the structure, the pyramid structure, is squared. But you don't use a square to represent the earth until after 4000 BC. So the shape of the structure tells me, puts limits for me on when it had to have been built. Interesting. Okay. All right. So then what do you say? Okay. So I'm saying that from my point of view, the uh, short of the pyramid having been built a full cycle back, which I don't think the reason why I don't think that's credible is because the pyramid is aligned very precisely to north, south, east, and west. If we had the kind of a comet strike that Randall Carlson says we had, the alignment of the earth would have changed. And so if the pyramid had been built before that comet strike, it wouldn't be in alignment anymore. What so if, the, okay, hold on. So the okay. pyramid must have been built after the comet strike, and it has a squared form, which says it has to have been built after 4000 B.C. Okay, so now this is where I'm going to jump in and suggest something here. Okay. It's too accurate. It's too accurate, north, south, east, and west. We can't build with laser pointer technology, GPS. Your house today is not directly north, right? So maybe there was the commonality of error built into the north south east west orientation and maybe it was lined up correctly before the comet strike if it had been there's nothing that forces the effect of that comet that that comet strike had a hit on head on the earth the 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 probability far and away is that that pyramid would no longer be in alignment that's what no that's what i'm saying it fell back into alignment that's and what, I, I, that's I'm, what saying I'm saying. That short, short of the Earth falling back into its own alignment, which I, I don't think is a force that, well, there, I, mean, I suppose theoretically there could be a force that pulls the Earth back into alignment. <laughs> uh, I, I suppose that is a possibility. But from my perspective, it, it looks to me as if the symbolism says the pyramid was built after 4000 BC. The reason why I think it was before 4000 BC is the uh, the lack of hieroglyphics there, which has been talked about, you know, too, too much. We don't need to go there. But I think it was a hand me down. It was a second hand monument. The the, the the dynastic period entered 3000 BC. Mene, everybody uh, went upper and lower Egypt unite. And when they got those pyramids were already sitting in the background. They were already there. I really, really feel that. Otherwise, there would be hieroglyphics all over the the Giza Plateau. And this is the other thing that's perplexing to me. And you're a symbolist guy. You understand symbolism more than anybody on this planet. <laughs> it, it, it is this. There is the lack of pyramids in hieroglyphics, papyrus, and otherwise all over East. It just it doesn't exist. Why would right. not the most important thing in the history of mankind, not only Egypt, but on this planet, being the Great Pyramid, not be represented anywhere? You would think that they would right. have it. I agree. that That's very odd that, that we don't have surviving images of it. Although, if unless those surviving images were carved into stone, they wouldn't have survived. Um, uh, from what I understand, we wouldn't know that there was ever a skyscraper in New York City 5,000 years from now, except for whatever pieces of it were made of stone. The metal is going to be gone. So the lack of evidence doesn't necessarily say anything. I agree that it looks like that the Great Pyramid in particular was built before writing, but writing doesn't appear until 3,000 B.C., so we still have a thousand year play between when the symbolism says to me it, it had to have been built after 4000 BC, but the lack of writing says it was probably built before 3000 BC. Right. And uh, when, yes, yes. And when you look at the Valley of the Kings, obviously they didn't have any issues 
uh, um, in those burial chambers where the sarcophagus, li- where the fa- the mummies were in state, they had right. no problem floor to ceiling covering every square inch with something. Yeah, I agree. And if if there had been a system of writing at the time the pyramid was built, we would expect to find some kind of writing in it. And there was a system of writing. If you go back to uh, uh, Mene, if you go all the way back to the original uh, burial mounds that were there, there are plenty of, uh, what's the word? I I don't want to brain freeze here. Uh, uh, Tabs, right? They had a written language going back to 3000 BC. They were marking things then. Well, they had a right. they had a they had symbolism and, and a written language back then that even predated ancient Sumer, right? right. So that's right. Uh, well, well, I mean, yeah, it looks like we had at least proto writing by three thousand BC. I mean, they they can't even say for certain that some of the pre dynastic things don't represent a system of writing. It just they don't have, they can't prove it. No, they can't. But and so again, back to my reasoning here. This is why Egyptologists are wrong, and that's why Egyptologists fight amongst themselves too, as well. There is no standard here. They can't even tend to agree <laughs> with each other. But is this? So if you if you advance off of thirty one hundred BC, uh, Upper and Lower Egypt united, and you're going with let's say Menes right at that point, three hundred and fifty years later, twenty six fifty BC. 300 years later, 350 years later, they there was already a system of writing in place. So they had all of the opportunity to litter the, the, the Giza Plateau with something marking the dating of what was going on. Why? They right. marked all of those years by name. By name, right? right? The most important e- the event of each year was the name of the year. They didn't have numbers, but they had names. Why wasn't the year 2650 BC the year of the Great Pyramid? I'm just right. saying. Somebody help no, me right, out here. You're right. There are a lot of interesting unanswered questions. Absolutely. And I agree that this is oh, absolutely an open question as to when these things were built. Um, and you ask two researchers and you get compelling reasons why – a different answer applies. So it, these these are real hard questions. I, um, Ed Nightingale, a friend of mine, is a person who is a proponent of trying to get a bunch, a number of researchers in a room together for a weekend and and focus on a single question and try to hash out a common view. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Something we... tells me that you'd end up with half of the researchers <laughs> dead. But... <laughs> oh man, especially if I'm there. I mean, and, and the reason, and Ed's research, I swear, uh, Laird, I hope he's listening right now, has floored me face down, face plant. That guy is really, yeah. really, really good. I mean, yeah, he, he is really, really, really good. Uh, I like Ed very much. Uh, and I'm really happy. Uh, Risa, my wife, and I were, um, had the privilege of being employed. involved in helping him organize that book. We could see that the material that he had was was so essential. I mean, he'd made presentations on it at CPAC and places like that. It just absolutely top-notch stuff. And it dovetailed with a a number of things that I had looked into. So um, we were really happy to be friendly enough with him to be asked to help him put that book together. Plus he's so humble, right? He, he, you know, I'm like, dude, man, you're freaking me out. Hey, man, I'm just a guy, man, just like you. I just. Do you know that he he is a master wood carver? That he has restored artifacts for the Vatican. I know. He's so humble, man. Just so humble. Uh, uh, No, Ed is a Ed is a true game changer in every sense of the word, and uh, his research is not going to go away. It's gonna it's gonna c- no. continue to piss people off and ruffle feathers. <laughs> I'm, I'm being serious. I'm being serious. I'm not. I'm and not you, kidding. You know, he's been working from satellite images that are accurate to centimeters. They've adjusted for parallax. These are military satellite images of the Giza Plateau. And one of the things that came out of his studies was that every major survey that was ever done of the Giza Plateau grossly misstates certain dimensions, certain key dimensions that he needed to be able to sort things out. The guy who did the measuring of each of these surveys of the plateau for one reason or another grossly misstated certain of these dimensions. And he can demonstrate it from the photographic images. But just 
it makes you wonder um, from site to site how much re- deliberate misrepresentation there has been done in the material that we work from. What do you think it's going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back here when uh, history is definitely going to have to be rewritten? If if some of the even one little piece of your information or John Anthony West or Shock or, or Hancock or Baval or Ed Nightingale, one little thing, if it breaks and is proven, then everything else, right? That It's going to be the domino principle. Everything is going to fall over. But that means a lot of books have to be reprinted, right? The education system needs to, the history needs, it, it is a big, big deal. But something is going to do this. What is that piece that you think is going to flip this uh, thing that- over? That's very, very hard to say what will actually turn the tide because and how you how you perceive the tide as turning. Um, right now, we have one of the questions I get asked all the time is what traditional researchers think of my work, and I laugh because there's not a single traditional researcher who has any respect whatsoever for any of my work. But that doesn't matter to me because we have a vibrant community of alternative researchers who are making their own headway without regard to the independent or the the traditional researchers. So it's really a moot point to us whether they ever get on board with it or not. So when we talk about the tide turning, from one perspective, you're saying what's going to cause traditional researchers to accept the this other body of work? Um, that will happen. The Gobekli Tepe has been a step in that. No They've doubt. Had to accept that there are were have been were earlier cultures than at the time of the Sphinx. You know what's so brilliant uh, uh, about Gobekli Tepe? Oh, by the way, I'm just going to let you know uh, our audience, which is vast and large, one of the biggest. Every time somebody says Gobekli Tepe on the show, they drink. So, <laughs> so by now. Our audience is plowed, so we can say what, whatever you, we you want. You haven't noticed me slurring my words yet? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> They're like, Laird, keep going. You should see Twitter, man. It's so funny. It, it, this is what is fantastic and wrong about Gobekli Tepe at the same time. Quite simply, we have been told forever that 3000 B.C. was it. Before then, nada. Nothing. That's it. Everything happened there, whether it was Mesopotamia or ancient Egypt. And and even Mesopotamia is not talked about. All the focus has always been on ancient Egypt and the dating there. Sumer is not really talked about, right? So anyway, right. 3000 B.C. Now, Gobekli Tepe is not 4000 B.C. It's not 5. It's not 6. It's not 7. We're talking about a 12,000-year-old plus site that goes back now to officially dating at around 10,000 B.C. or possibly older. It right. simply was not supposed to exist. Now, is, isn't that the game changer? Why isn't Go Beckley Tepe on CNN? Why isn't it the headline news around the world? Why isn't this the most biggest news in the history of mankind? I don't right. get it, re- it. It really should be because uh, a lot of the key pieces or the potential for a lot of the key pieces fall into place simply because it exists. Um, going much further than that is tricky because the Ice Age sort of wipes out any trail of evidence. So it, it's hard to connect things before that. Um, but I think there are all sorts of things that are going to turn up. And what what the game changer depends on the expectation that one of those things will turn up in the hands of a researcher who is as genuinely honest as the researchers of, say, the 1800s. I tend to prefer sources that were before 1940 because I have confidence that those researchers are giving me the straight scoop about what they've discovered. I'm not confident. The farther past 1940 we get, the less confident I am that I'm getting the truth from the researchers. Um, a lot of the evidence, to my way of thinking, existed in the l- area of land in southern Egypt that was covered up when they built the Aswan Dam. Mm-hmm. Now, they re- uh, Egyptologists have ha- had to have known that that was a critical region that shouldn't be covered, and yet didn't raise the kind of stink you would expect to stop it from being covered. Yeah, um, right, 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 right. And when we look, when we talk about, it's one thing to reference uh, uh, ancient Egypt 
uh, at 3000 BC about Stone Age man and how uh, we come off of that uh, that age. Suddenly, we have an upright civilization that knows about farming and 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 geometry and mathematics and architecture and engineering and and everything else, and they were able to build that without steel or or the wheel. Okay, that that's pretty fantastical in its own right because it it creates more questions than it answers. But right. if you take that same statement that that historians will give us, and you apply that to Gobekli Tepe, that is seven thousand years older. Wait a minute right. here. Now we've got a real problem because coming off of the Ice Age, the, there wasn't anything there, allegedly, according to them, that would present that kind of knowledge to quarry, to carve, to think in 3D, to do that kind of artistic. The, the artwork at Gobekli Tepe is stunning. Stunning. It is. It's stunning yes. by today's standards. Yep, right, it is, <laughs> and in that exact same region of the world, in that same era, you see the first cultivated grain, the first um, animal husbandry, the first metallurgy, um, arguably the first um, ships. Um, you certainly have the stonework. Um, you, you it looks like we have the the basis of a proto written language. All sorts of really interesting things happening all in that one era in that one place. And it centers on all the same skills that people like the Dogen and the Buddhists are saying were instructed to us. That's right. So so it's in keeping with the mythical outlook, whether it proves it or not is another question. And, and you know what else? And I, I love talking to Robert Schock about this because he gets it. I don't know why. Urfa Man is not even more famous <laughs> than the the Great Pyramid. Yes. That is one of the most stunning pieces of, of sculpture on this planet. Again, yes. hidden away in a museum, not talked about. It should be the first thing that is brought up when we talk about the history of everything. That's right. Imagine a hunter-gatherer conceiving of that. And making mistakes, too. Six fingers. Right, that's right. <laughs> you go. <laughs> I keep I keep bringing this up. Um, if you are going to take the time, uh, Urfa Man. Now they're dating that with with crazy numbers, right? So let's talk about that. It, it, let's say ten thousand BC. Let's. It, it's just a round number. You have other things to worry about back then, like fighting off animals. Right, <laughs> keeping your family right. alive, getting up in the morning, surviving the night, right. waking <laughs> yeah. up in the morning, and then eating. But <laughs> yeah. during that period, Lair, of, of that, somebody is carving this beautiful sculpture, taking the time to do that, and making the mistake of a wrong finger count. Yeah, I know. That doesn't make sense. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. So what's actually going on here? Was it Urfa Man? Was it Urfa Alien Man? Right. I mean, there's certainly enough images. You know, somebody was saying that, um, gee, if there were uh, tradi was traditional sci-fi alien-type contacts in ancient time, why don't any of the ancient cultures talk about it? And the response to it was, that's practically all they talked that's about. That's all they talked about. <laughs> How many angels and demons and gods and knowledge from the stars do you need? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I mean, that's all they talked about. That's that's a really, really, really good point. One of these days, I can't wait. One of these days, we're going to be able to sit down and uh, break bread and and have a couple of drinks and really have a very in depth uh, uh, conversation. Now. Uh, and I, I, I welcome that. I can't wait. But let me let me kind of end on this note. You have been dealing with this for so many years. Why suppress the information? Is it something that we cannot handle? Is there a reason behind it? Or do they know quite simply that there is a prehistory to man that they know about, but they just don't want to share that with us? Why, why hide it? Um, or why fight it is, is probably the better question. Why fight it? There, there are a combination of things going on. Um, at the simple level, it comes down to reputations of academics who have a theory that 
who would be severely embarrassed if it were, was shown not to be true. That's a very simplistic level. On a more complicated level, well, we can, if you consider that the length of time between the Wright brothers' first flight and the invention of the space shuttle is about the same length of time as between the invention of the space shuttle and now. And during that second period, we've seen quantum improvement in every kind of a device, an electronic device, and every technology on the planet has gone through exponential improvement except space technology, which should have been the priority, right? Right. We're working with the the vehicle that they're talking about sending to Mars that they trundled out, the Orion vehicle, isn't two feet off the mark of what the Apollo capsule was. It isn't two feet off the mark of what the space shuttle was. So clearly there have been similar kinds of improvements in space technology that the public doesn't know a thing about. And that says that science is being conducted on two levels, one for private use and one for public. And this the truth about the situation here with these ancient studies, I think, also falls into that category, that the groups that benefit by having private developments in science also benefit by having this information not come to the surface. And is, is, that, an, is that reason enough in your eyes? I know you're going to say no, but is that, does that validate anything? Um. I mean, I can see, especially if it started out in a wartime mentality, that there's a military rationale for not letting technology out. Right, right, right. Yeah, um, it's, it's depressing to me. I, I, we, we're fighting this all the time. And see, this is, this is what's really trippy, is you get it, I get it, our guests get it, our audience gets it. We don't, we don't fight it. We, we want the knowledge. Bring it to us. We are smart enough to uh, figure it out on our own. If it's too fantastical, okay, whatever. We we can flush it out uh, on our own. We're okay with it, and I think the rest of the world would be too. I don't understand the uh, the fight, the the oppression, and and suppression at the same time. Right, I know. Um, also, um, when I was a freshman at Vassar College, the first person I heard speak on campus was Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead is the person who provided the military with the rationale for why they should not reveal the truth about UFO contacts, if there is a truth. She said that every culture that has come face to face with a superior culture, really, really bad things happen to them. And that if we don't want those bad things happening in our culture, that the, the government needed to keep this stuff secret. Yeah, I can argue that all day long. I can argue that all day long. There's a, a little bit of truth to that. And if you want to bring up Columbus or Balboa or some other, you know, things in Spanish uh, ships right. coming across the Atlantic. I, I Okay, there is something to that. The other part of that is, which is obvious, if they wanted to do something bad, it would have already been done. Right. But I don't think they're talking so much about the alien cultures doing bad things to us. I think they're talking about what happens to the psyche of the culture that's the lesser culture. I look at the looking at the uh, my, my upcoming book about the Maori in New Zealand. Oh, we never got to that. That, that doesn't matter. But the, there are psychological problems that the Maori culture in New Zealand and Australia have because of the introduction of European culture into their space. You know, can I get you to hang on for another 10 minutes? <laughs> sure. Why? Okay, we got to do Maori. I can't see. That's the, that, that is the, the, the joy of having an open-ended conversation. It just goes where it goes. But <laughs> we had plans for tonight. So we'll but come that back. That doesn't matter. It makes no difference. Yeah, but well, yes, I'll hang on. I'd be happy to hang on. Okay. Uh, stay right there. When we come back, we'll do a little of overtime with Laird Scratton. Why? Because he's the best, and this is Fade to Black. Stay right there. Listen to my boy, 
Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. So you went to dinner last night, you had your favorite pasta. Or maybe you had a heavy, spicy meal and it left you. Get the tea.com. Maybe you mowed down a huge steak and your plumbing is all plugged. Get the tea.com. Our super strength tea will take care of your occasional. It's all organic and non-GMO. Get rid of We have so many great supplements, but our super tea is number one. GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. So, you love talk radio. Then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. I'm Matt Ray with America's First News. We all know if you're planning a trip, you should shop and compare, right? But why endlessly search the web when you don't have to? Flight Services helps you find the lowest possible airfare. Talk directly to a travel pro right now for the best deals available. Their travel pros have additional discounts not found on websites. And Flight Services provides 24-hour customer service. Call toll-free 844-845-9944. That's 844-845-9944. What's up, Fader Knots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full range boom boxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this, it's amazing. It's just 129 bucks and use the promo code JCRTWS and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple, just go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner, go back Lee Tepe. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. Don't forget to visit all of our sponsors, Life Change Tea, GetTheTea.com, River Moon Coffee, New Pharma, Ancient Life Oil, and Studio Dome Speakers. All of the banners are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com, and the promo codes are there. And subscribe to our podcast where we have over 700 archive shows. Just two dollars a month. Again, the banners are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com, and you become you can become a fader knot, an official fader knot. Just go to our membership section 
on the website. You can get everything. You can get the live bunker cam. I'm waving to it now to everybody out there. And uh, you can go all the way up and get autographed hats and T-shirts and all of that fun stuff. All right, just visit jimmychurchradio.com. Our guest tonight, Laird Scranton, doing a little uh, overtime here because he's got a new book coming out in May next year on the Maori tribe uh, in New Zealand. Now, most uh, most don't know about the Maori. Uh, let's talk about that for a second, Laird. Who were they, and where did they come from? Well, the Maori are a Polynesian tribe, they have a lot in common uh, in terms of their rituals and their language and culture with other Polynesian cultures around um, on various islands. They arrived, are thought to have arrived in New Zealand um, a few hundred years before the Europeans who arrived around 1600. Um, that, that timing is open to some question. Uh, I had realized early on in my studies that there's a, an important connection between the Maori and the Dogon. Uh, the Dogon refer to their Adam as the Po, and the Maori have the exact same concept of the Po uh, and understand it the same way. So I had intended to write a book about the Maori all the way along since I wrote the first book. My intention was the next book was going to be about the Maori, and I kept getting bumped and bumped and bumped and bumped by other material. Finally got down to writing the book and realized that that was a fortunate thing because Maori culture and language t ties to every era of cosmology and language that I've studied from Africa, Egypt, India, Tibet, China, um, uh, Turkey, uh, even the UK. Um, there are connections to... The, the Maori. Uh, the Maori are a much later version of the tradition, so there are a lot of the symbolic reversals I talk about have happened, that deities who you see as being female in earlier cultures are male in later cultures. Um, so what are you suggesting with that? That's a pretty bold statement, so let's get direct here. What are you suggesting? Well, clearly the, the traditions are related. From my perspective, what happened, and this is supported by myths in the UK and in New Zealand, it looks as if when uh, the pygmy culture that was associated with um, Orkney Island was eventually forced out of Ireland, that um, members of that tradition uh, left by boat across the Western Sea and stopped various places along the way. You see um, connections to the Hopi Indians in the Americas. You see connections down in South America. You see connections at Easter Island. And you finally see connections uh, in New Zealand. Um, the purpose of the book is to, to tie all these connections together. We're using, um, we're fortunate with the Maori that we know what their traditions were. We know what they were teaching in their schools. And we know what their priestly tradition was. Uh, we have a vibrant language to compare to other things vibrant set, set of um, artifacts and so forth. We just don't have a long history. We have a history that starts around 1600 AD and uh, trying to infer back from that what, what the truth might have been. But it looks like we have direct connections to um, pre-Hindu cultures. It looks like we have direct connections to the, the pygmy and fairy traditions in the UK. Um, a lot of really, really interesting stuff and uh, and new perspectives on a lot of the old stuff, a different viewpoint. Um, in Ireland, the myth, there were two myths. One myth said that these people left in boats across the Western Sea. The other myth says that they went to the underworld. You go to New Zealand and the cultures there say they, they arrived by boat for across the Eastern Sea and there's an ancient name for New Zealand that means first circle of the underworld. Right. So you've got cross confirmation in the in, even in the myths about what's going on. Uh, you've got a priestly tradition where the firstborn child of every family had an option to become a to become a priest. If you if you consider that and and now go back and look at ancient Egypt, the slaying of the firstborn takes on a different slant. Right. They may, may have been trying to kill the priestly class. Right, right, right. Well, so there are all, all these connections that even connect into Christianity and later um, religious uh, practices. Did anything predate the Maori in New Zealand, or were they the first humans to set foot? That's a highly controversial subject, and especially in New Zealand, it's highly controversial. Right. That there is evidence that 
at very least, it was a pygmy culture that built the same kind of mound structures that you see on Orkney Island. Uh, and all over uh, there um, in Ireland, the single most common archaeological structure they find is a horseshoe shaped ring of stones. That's right. They find it everywhere, but they don't know what it represents. You go to New Zealand, and those horseshoe shaped rings are the village schools where the priests were being taught. So you have these connections back and forth to Celtic culture, um, to all sorts of different um, interesting cultures. Um, now, what about the Negati Hotu? Were they there before the Maori, or are they one and the same? Um, there are a couple of different rumored traditions in New Zealand. There's a, there's a group of uh, reportedly red haired, um, a, a red haired tribe that uh, may connect to Celtic cultures, uh, but. The sources on these, these things are very spotty. The evidence is the sort of evidence that tends to get covered up or mislaid by the traditional researchers. And the official line in, in New Zealand is that there was nothing there before the Maori. Yeah, that was my question to you. What did they teach there? I mean, what uh, – uh, and see, this oh. is – well, let, let's let's address that first. What do they teach in New Zealand? Okay, what do they teach in modern times? Yes, right they, now. That the traditional line in New Zealand in the modern day is that the Maori were the first people who were there. Eh, I'm not buying it. And no, I mean a lot of people aren't because there there's evidence sitting around the islands that something that clearly is not Maori existed at pre-Maori. Now, uh, now this is again. I always think the opposite. Right when I when I get a, a piece of information, this is what I do, Laird. I flip it over 180 degrees, <laughs> and I just look at it that way. So we have this west to east migration that is the traditional population of the Pacific Islands, populating of the Pacific Islands all the way up to Easter Island, right? Right, the, the, <laughs> right, the east to west, right? Right, right. No, west to east. Oh well, yes, coming out of coming out of um, like. India areas through Australia or out of Australia populating those islands. Right. Yeah. There's, there's a flow of uh, migration that comes from the West, but it also looks as if we have a flow that came from the East and, exactly. more, and maybe more than one flow. That's what that's, I'm saying. That's you see. I like the way you think, man. And this <laughs> is, this is my problem with, with the traditional way of looking at this canoes in the Pacific ocean could not have been laden with the provisions and the manpower to survive on the open ocean. I don't care how long, how many thousands of years they said that this was going on to get all the way to Easter Island. Right. When it would it would have been easier to go from Peru <laughs> going in the opposite direction, even against the ocean currents. But it's it's so much closer. It, right. That would make more sense to me. But canoes, canoes. Right? I can't, right. Standing out on East, if you look at Easter Island on a map and you see the next closest thing to there and just imagine being on a canoe, a canoe, not a ship, man, a canoe. Right. But, I mean, we, we already see evidence of a migration from Turkey down around North Africa to Orkney Island. Clearly, that trip didn't happen by canoe. So whoever did that trip already had technology that was sea, ocean, ocean worthy. Right. And so, again, going against the grain here to suggest that canoes arrived at Easter Island or New Zealand, for that matter. Right. right. Um, no. Either it was some kind of ocean-going vessel, it, but but to suggest that it was canoes, palm trees, some crazy right. act, just, yeah, No, that, I don't. It, it is crazy. And even though the cultural memory, memory may be of that, that may not be what actually happened that's right that's right or or the and the other part is maybe these islands were connected right in, in really ancient times it's quite possible that there, there were easier connections to be made across the ocean to that yeah because of uh you know some of the flora fauna uh the connections not only with that and you can say well it was seeds it was floating in the ocean okay possibly but birds and insects and other things uh, could not have made that same migration unless there was a land bridge of some kind. No, you see, two swallows carried that coconut on a, <laughs> on a string. <laughs> oh, man. Laird, you're the best, man. Uh, when does the book come out? 
Um, so May uh, 2018 is when the Maori uh, book is due out from Inner Traditions. Um, I don't think they'll be able to improve on that scheduling. Um, if not, I have some other material that I am trying to convince Inner Traditions to prioritize um, and haven't been really very successful at, at convincing them. Um, and talk about some of the primordial topics that we were talking about or touching on earlier. So there's a possibility that we'll find some other way of getting that material out in between. Well, I, I look forward to it. And Inner Traditions uh, is uh, uh, very good with uh, getting the material to me right away. So I look forward to it. And are you going to be speaking anywhere uh, out there anytime soon? Yes, uh, with the the tour to Orkney Island, I'll be speaking on uh, Friday, um, the fifteenth of September, at the Air Hotel in Kirkwall, Orkney. That's a a free event open to the public. Um, I'm supposed to speak on the same venue with Eric von Daniken and Andrew Collins at the ARE Mysteries Conference in Virginia Beach the first weekend in October. That's October fifth through eighth. Um, and uh, I'm constantly doing uh, radio interviews and podcasts and things like that. I'm I've have long been considering trying to trying to put on some kind of an event in the um, Northeast in the Hudson Valley region, um, and it's possible that'll come to fruition this this fall or early next spring. We'll see what happens. Yeah, we got to get some more stuff on the East Coast. Everybody is uh, constantly crying. You know, the West Coast in Europe gets all the best stuff, but we don't now, get I'm also uh, doing um, uh, some webinars that are associated with the CPAC conference on the West Coast this year. So I'll be doing basically a PowerPoint presentation for one of those webinars. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, yeah, that ARE sounds really good. October 5th through the 8th, uh, Eric Von Daniken and Andrew Collins. It doesn't get any better than that. Uh, also, there's the, the New Magical Egypt uh, series. I'm featured in a couple of seg upcoming segments of the New Magical Egypt segment. But this I, is the part two. I just got it. Um, I, you know what? I was going to announce that earlier today that I just got it. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. I am so, so, so excited about this. So I'll, I'll give everybody an update on uh, the first couple of uh, segments of that uh, by tomorrow's show. But I also, just got... I, I've seen the promo for the third uh, segment, and I have to say that my silhouette does some amazing work. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Laird Scrant. Laird, thank you so much. And, and please give my best, uh, Teresa, and, and thank you for all that you do. You're the very best. Yes. Thank you very much for asking me on. I'm happy to come on anytime. You got it. Laird Scranton, everybody. Thank you, Laird. Thank you, Risa. The, the very best. Okay, now you can chase Laird down on Facebook. Very, very active on on, on, on Facebook. So you can go uh, chase him down there. His uh, his website, LairdScranton.com. The links for that are over at uh, JimmyChurchRadio.com. With that, um, I almost want to take a break here. But we're at the very, very end of the show. So let me do this. Let me get my head together. And and I need to talk about a discovery that just happened over in Egypt, uh, talking about everything that we discussed tonight. Archaeologists have discovered three tombs that date back around 2,000 years in southern Egypt. They were found in the burial grounds at al Kamin. Uh, just south of Cairo. The tombs contained, are you ready for this? The collection of uh, different sarcophagus, uh, of course, stone coffins, as well as clay frag. <coughs> Whoa, a sneeze live on the air. It's weird. That just came up out of nowhere. Somebody, a, a, an ancient <laughs> god of ancient Egypt, just hit me with this. Um, so they, they've got this. The Egyptian Antiquities Ministry said that the discovery suggests that the area was a great cemetery for a long span of time. One of the tombs, which was reached through a shaft carved in rock, just when you think, you know, that, that nothing else can be discovered out there, right? They found this. So they find the shaft, they go through, and they find this this uh, tomb. It contained four sarcophagus that had been uh, sculpted to depict human faces. You should see these images, by the way. And another, they found six burial holes all through the shaft, including one for the burial of a small child. 
Now, they have collected the clay fragments there, and those that were found at the site date the tombs right now between the 27th dynasty, founded at around 525 B.C., if you know your Egyptian history like I do, and, of course, the Greco-Roman era, which lasted uh, between 332 B.C. and, of course, going all the way up to the 4th century A.D. Very exciting stuff to be discovered out there. Now, I want to, when we have this, one of the things that Laird had uh, touched upon, I don't know how much is buried under the sand. It is one of the, and the reason it seems obvious, but just listen to me for a second. When the Sphinx sat there until it was rediscovered around the 4th century B.C., um, it was already buried under sand, right? And that was then, all right? Think about this. The The Great Pyramid was, was had sand going up uh, uh, its sides. It was already semi-buried out there on the Giza Plateau. Okay, this wasn't some amazing site that they kept clean and kept maintained. No, it, the sand in the Sahara overtook everything. Right, So what is buried under the sand there? We don't know. I don't know why um, collectively the nations of the world are not getting together with ground-penetrating radar and going completely square foot by square foot over all of uh, Egypt. I don't understand. There is stuff underneath. I would take, this is what I would do, and I'm not kidding. Think about this. I would have giant vacuum cleaners. I'm not kidding. I bring it in trucks. I would have tubes going miles out into the desert, miles out, and I would deposit the sand there. I would suck it up. I would start at the Giza Plateau, and I would suck every last grain of sand out of there until I got to bedrock and dirt. I would suck it all out. And we would find things underneath the sand there that would be mind-blowing. And it would be simple to do. But nobody wants to do it. It's like they don't want us to discover things. There is stuff there that they just don't want us to know. When we talk about what could be under the Sphinx and the things that Edgar Casey talked about and the discoveries that shock and the ground penetrating radar just in the Sphinx uh, enclosure itself, there is stuff down there. Don't want to know, right? Andrew Collins discovered a cave system underneath the Giza Plateau that goes underneath the Great Pyramid. Just let it go. It wasn't supposed to exist. It doesn't exist. I, I, there's nothing there. And there, it turns out that there is. Not there was. There is. We need to go and do all of this. I don't know why. Um, I, I don't. I don't know why they don't want us to find out the dating of the Sphinx or the dating of the, 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 the Great Pyramid. What's going on in Giza itself. I, I don't know why. I would have everything there excavated. You know, in front of, and I don't know if you know this, but there's a couple of walls um, in front of the Great Pyramid that go all the way down um, into Cairo. Those walls weren't investigated. Um, They were sort of mapped out 150 years ago, right, when they did all of the original topography there. Then forgotten about. It's only now in recent times since uh, the mid-1970s that this stuff has gone back and, and uh, has been excavated, and they are, they are doing digs there. But they don't want it to go further. There is also um, uh, another object uh, there, and it is, um, it's called the uh, invent- inventory um, uh, 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 the uh, inventory. It's 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 a it's a rock it, identical to what is in between the Sphinx paws. And this inventory that is there and it's big, they don't show it to the public. It is under lock and key, it is in a sealed up box, welded shut, and they don't want people to uh to view it because apparently on this it says that Khufu went to the Great Pyramid to go and do repairs. 
to do repairs um, in Giza, to do repairs there, uh, clearly saying that the, it, it existed, that he was going to fix it up and clean up the joint, not build the Great Pyramid to repair it. And Khufu was still alive. Now, we need to really, why? I don't get it. So think about that for a second. There is stuff that is being uh, suppressed and held back from us. And I, I quite simply don't know why. The reason um, I say that like this, and, and, and hear me, hear me out. We can handle it. We can handle the knowledge. If it says that um, historians have gotten it wrong and British uh, uh, historians have gotten everything wrong and Egyptologists have gotten it wrong and the the uh, the pyramid scrolls have gotten it wrong, that that things are just, okay. We're all right with that. We are. There is so much evidence out there now that says that there's another story going on that it's it, it it's been out there for long enough that we just need to go and just go and 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 reveal this stuff. I don't understand why. That's why guys like Laird and Bavall and and uh uh Graham Hancock and uh Randall Carlson, I could go on and, and Laird that their information that they are bringing forward clearly suggests that there is another story here. But nobody wants to listen. Nobody want, and it, it is continuing to mount every day that passes. Uh, Scott Creighton's book, all right, the Great Pyramid Hoax. Here we have an excellent book with excellent research material and and evidence evidence that says that we have been lied to and that it's it's a hoax and it wasn't Khufu. Period. That's the end of the story. But nobody wants to listen. You would think that th this kind of research, when you have uh, John Anthony West and Robert Schock bring this information forward, very, very well researched, and it's just obvious that it would be taken serious, and we can move on and enjoy the fact that things are not what they seem, and we're figuring it out, and we're okay with it. But no, everything is suppressed. Everything is held back. They, I, you know, if they don't want to rewrite history. You know, the the day that it shows up, what, on Wikipedia, then we're going to take it serious? Is that where we're at today? And that's the way I feel. And there is another episode of Fade to Black. Up and charted. Thank you, Laird Scranton. Tomorrow night, everybody, David Wilcock, right here on Fade to Black. That is why we do this show. What a great show tonight. Thank you, Laird. Amazing. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Paul, Mark D. Cobra, LJ3, Renee, Jonas. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar, Fady by Dale, Webmaster, Drew, The Geek, Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2017 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. They cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Until tomorrow night, David Wilcock, right here. This is Fade to Black. Everybody be safe. Go Beckley Tappy.